Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. General Assembly. <laughs> well. You've got the duties. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. The armor. Can we start? Yeah, let's get started. I'm ready for you guys. Let's do it. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. We're now in session. We'd note that uh, we moved our meetings for the evening meetings to 6.30 instead of 7. That was done back in early January, I guess, which is why we're here at 6.30 as opposed to 7.00. Okay, Ms. Thompson. Okay, let's bow our heads for just a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for every person that's in this room tonight because that tells us that they really care about their community and what's going on. I pray with all the big decisions on our plate that we all work together as one. There is so much power in unity that we have patience, we have kindness, and we have balance. I just pray that you'll be with us all tonight as we lead this county and always know that we can't lead a county if we don't have its citizens with you. Amen. Let us all stand and say the pledge to our great flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number uh, 2.1, uh, the Life Saving Awards, the Sheriff has asked that we postpone that. Uh, they have things ongoing with uh, the Sheriff's Department and that will not be necessary tonight. Or, excuse me, it, we won't be able to do that tonight. Uh, so that will be off the agenda. We'll either, either move it uh, to February the 7th or February the 21st, uh, depending on the Sheriff's direction. I'm really sorry I because when we went to the canines retirement party Friday, we met him. Oh my gosh, he's precious. Wouldn't touch him, but he's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and me and Steve thought it'd be a great idea for him to come here tonight so we could acknowledge him and watch all y'all with that dog in this room. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, one big dog. Oh my gosh, he was absolutely gorgeous. So, do do me a favor, one. if you will, hold up both hands. No. No, I just want to see you have, have, still I, have two hands. He, I didn't touch him. <laughs> I never touched him, but he was so beautiful. You did have that dog. Yes, he's gorgeous. <laughs> okay. Um, we have four public speakers. Uh, are these all for items on the agenda? As far as I know, when we last looked, yes. All right. Mr. Dodson. Mr. Dodson in, in the audience. Oh. Sorry, I left on hearing aids at home. <laughs> not a you may not want to hear us anyway. No, I My name is Cletus Dodson. I live at 809 Essex Drive here in Graham. All right. The reason I'm here tonight is the ordinances I've read about for the new on mobile home parks and and uh, everything. To me, they need to go back to the drawing board with this. They're already more restricted than a lot of the housing developments that are being put in the county. Also, mobile home parks, the commissioners previously wanted to have as many mobile homes in one area so they didn't upset all the 
residents, you know, people putting a mobile home here and mobile home here and getting uh, everything. Uh, this person, I don't want that mobile home as manufactured home inside my house and everything like that. So that's that's it. Also, the lot sizes right now for mobile homes are a lot larger than some of the uh, restrictions you put on uh, residential houses and all that. I was on part of the thing way back when they increased the lot size from. 12,000 square foot to 30,000 square foot that they require in mobile homes like that. Also, if you're going to have a meeting about this, please have it at night so the residents of the mobile home parks are, uh, can attend. Most of these are hard working people. They work in Alamance County. They're not transit people like that lives in the apartments that are being built in Alamance County or the homes that are being built on the edge of Alamance County where they live in Alamance County because our tax rate is lower and then they turn around and work in Durham, Chapel Hill, Raleigh or wherever like that. That's the uh, thing. And uh, the main thing uh, is if you will have the meeting at, at a nightly meeting not a daytime meeting that's the main thing i wanted to hear that but also they need to go back and redo some of these rules that they're thinking about changing and everything like that thank you for the time and anyway, we thank you thank you chairman paisley this is uh deborah Baxel. Uh, i'm going to interrupt now just for the benefit of the audience um, the planning director during her presentation, which hasn't come up yet, was uh, uh, going to share with you that she was going to request uh, with the ordinate revisions that the ones related to mobile homes and RV parks um, not go forward tonight because she does want to work with the planning board and her staff more on the revisions. So if there's anybody else in the audience that was going to speak to that, um, that's already going to be um, removed from tonight's consideration for the board. The remaining items, the other ordinance issues will go forward. Um, but I just wanted all of you to know that uh, before perhaps anybody else wanted to comment on that, although they certainly still can. but. Ms. Beckler, do you also, you and I talked earlier today about um, the timing of these meetings, you know, AM meetings versus PM meetings. Do you want to go ahead and address that? Sure, I'd be happy to. This probably would be a, a good time, Chairman. So um, I, what we discussed um, to try and address more of the public's needs, um, be more transparent, be more helpful, and to this gentleman's speaker, one of the things we talked about was that more people are available at night. So the proposal I would ask you to consider tonight going forward is that when there is a planning meeting, they typically meet the second Thursday of the month in the evening for those matters. And of course they make recommendations that come then to the board of commissioners. Um, for the last number of years, it would come to you as a commission on your agenda to set the public hearing, and then it gets put on some future date. That is not necessary under the law, and I think perhaps has added some understandable confusion to the public. So to make that a little more streamlined, what I'm proposing is that when there is that planning board meeting with a public hearing, that it automatically goes to the evening meeting of the following month. That will typically be about a five week give or take window. And that way at the planning board meeting, they will be able to tell any of the public that is there when it will be coming for you, before you with certainty and therefore have you know, more confidence um, in the whole process and be more transparent. 
And that will also give us time to meet the notice requirements if there are any. Correct. Absolutely correct. And Ms. Bechtel, I believe you said that would require a motion to make that change. Is that correct? Let's do that during the business portion of the meeting. I, I don't know that it does or not because I, I did not have time to research how it started, but in an abundance of caution to make sure we're absolutely correct, I would ask that you go ahead and do that as a, as a motion, uh, and then we don't have to worry about it going forward. And I'll ask that we do that during the business portion of the meeting. Sure. All right. Ms. Bechtel, am I ready to go ahead to the next speaker? Very good. Thank you. Uh, Max Morgan? Phil, Philip Morgan will be speaking on my behalf. All right. So you're skipping at this point. Thank you. Philip Morgan. Good evening, y'all. Um, well, her changing this kind of changed what, you know, what I had to say, because I was here to ask, you know, to there's some ordinance changes being done. The, the meeting was being asked for in the morning, and the people that this was going to affect would not be able to attend this meeting. You know, these are working people, like Mr. Dodson said. So that part of it's took care of. And now we're looking at some of these rules that they're cooking up as being excessive, unjustified, and discriminatory, discriminatory and borderline illegal. I have a handout to give to the commissioners, if, if I can. And there yeah. were some there's some rules that North Carolina has passed about unjustified um, regulation on manufactured housing and such that is they're not suggesting. And I, I'm not a legal person. Y'all can read the stuff and then take it from there. Um, the folks living in these parks don't appreciate don't deserve to be treated like second class citizens. They don't deserve to be pushed out to the outer edges of the county where we could find land to maybe develop a, a facility like we do. I mean, they deserve public water. They deserve to be close. Um, that much has been said. Now there's quite a few park owners here and I'm one of them of the ordinance that's coming in labeling us non-conforming. Now they're calling it legal non-conforming to section 3.2. Well, if you read section 3.2, if we get a lot that goes empty over 180 days, it's done. And in the normal course of park business, a, a lot will stay open. And in today's climate, getting houses, it takes a year. So somebody will rent a lot several months, but the home, that lot is still sitting there vacant. So the clock's ticking, man can't get a house. So, you know, stuff like that, for the amount of money of the properties that's in Alamance County of mobile home parks, you know what I mean? If they close the local store up for six months, you don't you don't shut his door. And we, we don't, as business owners, don't deserve that either. Um, so the park owners, landowners, they, they don't deserve to face that threat of devaluation. And also in the 3.2, we won't be able to expand any parks I personally have parks that has land for expansion. I couldn't, and I know some of the other ones do too. Uh, but with the nonconformity, you're pretty done. I mean, it says, oh, yes, well, they don't affect old parks. That's the argument. But yes, it does, because it has to come back, and it has to be all done. And last, we were, I was called a dying breed in the paper from Alamance News. It was an Alamance News after the planning board meeting. And I personally find that offensive, inflammatory, and it's untrue. Mobile home parks as a whole in this economy fills a gap that people can't pay eleven, twelve hundred bucks for rent. They can't pay it. And we fill that gap of first ownership and a rental that they can afford. Thank you. Thank you. And y'all want my my hand out. Please. Yes, Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
I'm going to try to pronounce his name. Cindy, is it Kirk Rivy? Kirby. Kirby? Okay. <laughs> my husband Jeff is speaking I, on my phone. I'm sorry. Uh, names are not my thing. I apologize. <laughs> not a problem. Okay. Well, maybe it's the writer. <laughs> <laughs> if I wrote it, you couldn't read it. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeff Kirby. I live at 3973 Dickey Mill Road in Mebane. Spell um, your name. K I, K I R B Y. Are you yeah. any candy catch, Kirby? Uh, since, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good person to claim. His daddy and my daddy were brothers. Aww. Yeah. Uh, I was about three years older than him in school. And Madam Clerk, without it taking off his time, That's please helpful. correct that to Kirby, please. Okay. So, uh, me and my wife do own two mobile home parks here in Alamance County. We provide a necessary service to retired, special needs, lower income households, and some really good people, some really good people. Uh, new rules restricting future development and labeling existing mobile home parks as non-conforming will only compound the housing, sh the housing shortage uh, in Alamance County. Uh, parks as non-conforming uh, in Alamance County, I shouldn't have looked up, uh, and increase financial obligations on those providing as much as as needed uh, the resource we ask you commissioners to postpone the discussion uh, on this matter to a later date that will more uh, accommodate um, outside of the first uh, shift workers uh, so the afternoon uh, for the hard-working taxpayers here in the county so they can attend and voice their concerns but uh, we do have a, a a lot of retired people in the park. It's a lot of good people in the park. Uh, the park is, um, uh, I think, uh, one of the parks, uh, especially, um, is, is like a little community within itself. Mm -hmm. uh, people walk up and down the road. They, how you doing, Miss Hayes? How you doing, Miss Parker? You know, you see them talking. It's just, it's just a great uh, little community there that's uh, really safe, and you know, and 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 we take care of that, you know, and um, and we would like to see you guys. Uh, do the same. Uh, as said earlier, uh, once a, a space moves out, then you only have uh, 90 days to fill that back up, uh, or you can be listed as non-conforming if that was to pass. Well, um, you don't want anybody to uh, feel like they need to, to to put somebody in there, a questionable neighbor, not being screened properly, just to get out of that non-conforming. So, you know, I, I feel like it, it could jeopardize, you know, the existing safety there. So, um, anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. And give me your first name again, please. Jeff. 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 Thank you. And Cindy. Cindy. Hmm. We had her name. We just didn't have uh, your first name or the correct last names. <laughs> you did a good job, Cindy. Mm -hmm. oh. she, uh, she comes. <laughs> Uh, when you call her for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. No, I come when she calls me. You were doing good until you said that. <laughs> no, she was <laughs> I kind of said that as a play on the <laughs> When I did so something really bad, my father used to say, you'll be pouring your own cereal in the morning. Sorry. <laughs> we might be lucky to get sure. Don't be in that dog house. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't have one of those. <laughs> one of those. Okay, commissioner responses. I do have a question. Um, just what the, you guys were talking about. Uh, the 180 days. And the 90 days, that's why I'm a little bit confused. You said 90, you said 100. It's 180 in the, in, in the 3.2 ordinance, in the Alamance County ordinance, 180 days. So it if says it's, for any reason, I, I think we printed it off and put it there. Yep. Um, I just wanted to clarify it because uh, he said 90, you said 180. Well, I just best my knowledge, it's 180. So in I'm essence, what you're saying is if it's 180 days and your property, that particular lot goes vacant for 180 days, you can't put anybody else in that's there. how I'm, I'm reading the, the draft ordinance it's, okay it, it says all existing parks will be called um, non-conforming yeah legal non-conforming subject to the 3.2 I think there's another number sure. behind it um, yeah. and it says for any reason it's empty 
other than seasonal, which I'm, I'm assuming seasonal would be like Christmas tree sales, okay. such as that, and we don't have really seasonal around here, that it would be yeah. done for any reason is what it says. And under normal course of events, 180 days can happen. Yeah. Whether finding some people, you know, it, it happens. Yeah. And like I said, you don't, you won't close the local mini mart down. That's right. <laughs> well, I just, well, just wanted to clarify yeah. that's okay. the, the, the difference. Yeah, Thank you very much. 180 days best of my knowledge. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I was thinking seasonal meant more towards the RV parks, mm -hmm. but they're relating us with them. So meaning RV travelers may be stationed in an RV park. You know, more one season than another, right, gotcha. kind of what I was pretending to do. Mm -hmm. But us being grouped in that um, arena, all of a sudden it makes you, sure. you can easily read that as a lot being empty for 180 days. Yeah. All of a sudden you got to follow, you know, and you just have to leave it empty if you want work to upgrade. Uh, my feeling is they, over the years, they have came down with so many uh, different restrictions on the parks that, um, we don't need any more. I mean, we're, you know, uh, like it was said earlier, uh, we're restricted more than than apartments, uh, housing, uh, you know, any city lots. You know, they got all these uh, new um, track builders uh, coming in, building stuff. You know, and um, we really provide a service to these low-income people that um, are struggling. Maybe the next phase is move out of the county. You know, if it can, you know continues to go like it is, or possibly even become homeless. You know, it's not out of the question. Uh, it seems far-fetched, but not. It's not far-fetched. It happens. It's not that far away. Mm -hmm. uh, these people, you know, 725 an hour, I think it's still been voted on as a minimum, minimum wage if you multiply that out. And uh, I know how people um, feel that um, uh, 30, 40, 60,000 a year, you still have trouble making that $1,200 house payment. Yeah. And, um, and you know, this, these people are, are, are a lot of them, not all of them. Um, a lot of them, their choice is to move in, is to live in a mobile home, but, uh, or in a park. But uh, a lot of them can't, uh, can't afford anymore, and they're right there in that borderline. It's all they can do to have a car and send their kids to school and, you know, try to get a better life. Uh, but anyway. Thank you. I just have one comment. Uh, uh, you mentioned, comment. hang on just one minute. Uh, you mentioned public water as a right and so forth. The county does not provide water, of course. Uh, you still have to comply with all the regulations and the planning, planning department regulations, health department regulations, but the county does not. A lot of the municipalities, uh, I should have left my mouth at home, but <laughs> uh, a lot of the cities you know, do re uh, provide water and so forth that we as a county do not. So. I, I'm, I'm aware of that, sir, but there is a limit to where Orange Alamance stops. Yeah. And, you know, when you get into public water wells and such as that, that's a pretty good step up. I understand. And, uh, yeah. As far as public facilities, I mean, closeness to the doctor, you know, Duke's moving into Mevin now. we got a lot of stuff going on, and, you know, the people need to be able to go to Duke, and they, they don't need to be able to. The rules that we, we're working on now, I don't think there's, we haven't found on the map anywhere that it can be placed with the land spacing that's being proposed. I don't see where you're going to put one. I guess what I'm trying to, the distinction I'm trying to uh, make a little clearer is you have all these cities that have their planning, their zoning, their whatever. Mm -hmm. the county at this point, other than the subdivision ordinances and the, was it 60 some? Uh, ordinances that we have, uh, yeah, we don't have a zoning yet at this point. Uh, may never have, and up till now we have not had. Uh, but you do have all these ordinances. But um, yeah, the cities, most of them do provide water of some sort. You guys, some of you guys with trailer parks provide your own water systems and so forth. But I just I wanted to make it clear, not to you necessarily. I think you guys that are in the business know, but the general public listening would not know. So, yeah, thanks. That is true. You know, I was going to say on the pie park, the one that we have, we have two wells that service the one park. I am, can say I am with the public water supply section, and I have to conform and do all the testing, yeah. not only one, 
but I have to test it on both wells that run together and serve that. Some of those tests that they put on us are $1,700 a piece mm -hmm. per well, and I have to do them twice a year. And that's not including your monthly bacteriological. I have to do lead and copper twice a year. You know, I, I can go on and, and name you all the nitrates, all the different testings that we have to do. But we do have a lot of expense in this. And again, I would reiterate what my husband said about the community. We bought this park back in, well, one of them we bought back in 1989. And we've had it ever since. I've got nine trailers. I just counted nine mobile homes people that were there when we purchased that park are still there. Wow. They retired from Cone Mills. One of them was a bailiff here in the, in the county uh, sheriff's department. You know, they are on fixed income. They, they have nowhere else to go. I could raise the rent, and you know, I, we don't get into rent discussions and things like that around through the park, but I guarantee you, I got one of the lowest rents in the county, bar none. And I still get increases with the cost of water testing and conforming those things. You can't pass on but so much to these people. They're good people, but they don't have an income. They're they're left on whatever Social Security is giving them. And with COVID and stuff like that, you just go by and check on them. You just try to be the best person you can be. And that's all we're asking of you people is to just if you would just vote with us and, and just try to keep some more restrictions off of these people because you think you're you're hurting us or it's coming down restriction of us but everything you do it eventually gets down to the little guy and you've got to stand up for the little guy because they, they're, they're good people we have good people there thank you one thing would if you want to do away with bubble homes in Alabama County it get us a lot of high paying jobs. <laughs> that's that's the bottom line. Uh, one, I I don't own a mobile home park, but I own I own several lots that rent out and stuff like that. Uh, one of my renters this past week, I was talking to him. He said, "I'm I, he's been renting from me since the mid '90s." Okay, the same mobile home he and he was worried about. He's selling the property and something happened because that's all he has. He says my credit's not good. Him and his wife both work in retail. She works for Walmart. I, I'm not going to say who he works for, but they have a disabled son. They've had some bad luck over the years you know, and stuff like that, so their credit's not that good. They cannot go out here and afford a $250,000 house or even if they the money was coming in where they could make the payment their credit score is not high enough for them to be able to do it and this is what these few rules will trickle down and affect our rent and stuff like that it's just like any time y'all do a tax increase it affects people's people's standard of living up you know whether no matter where it's at Thank you. I'm, uh, and I'm going to apologize to everybody online and everybody in the audience because I'm going to have to tighten up on because we'll, we won't get out of here till midnight if I keep just letting everybody speak. And I apologize for that, but we're going to have to tighten up on the, uh, on the rules. Okay. Any other commissioner comments? Just a quick one. Um, I, I hear in your voices it's almost like you feel like you have to make excuses for people who live in mobile home parks. I grew up in a trailer. My dad traveled for a living all over the state of Florida, South Carolina, Georgia. And when I was one years old, we moved into a trailer park in Fort Myers that said absolutely no children because it was all seniors. But the man let us stay there for a couple months. Every day, Grandma and Grandpa would come and go, can we push Pammy around the park? <laughs> Just, you know, just trust me, um, we all have to live somewhere. And when you talk about non-conforming in 90 days, you know, that's kind of like um, if you can't get the right person in there, then you just lose it. 
That's like Sunday school. You just don't get a body to fill in the classroom. You got to have a well prepared, especially for children, because they will eat you alive and know you're not prepared. So um, I just, it's funny how mobile homes at the beach are really awesome. But here in Alamance County, they may have a stigma to them. So, um, you know, I've always, with working with some of the real hard, difficult situations I work with, trust me, the bigger the house, the bigger the problems. So I don't want to hear us judging whatever kind of home someone lives in because we have a really hard time in this county with housing, with all kind of people from all walks of life. And any one particular day, we can be at the bottom of our luck. And we need every kind of situation for every kind of person. And I'm just thankful. And I just, I don't want us to make it hard on folks that already have it hard on them. And this right here says extreme buffer. I want to know if extreme buffers are used with solar farms. Because the solar farms I've went around Alamance can look at it have a bunch of dry, dead azalea bushes. So I would love to know the difference between a mobile home park extreme buffer compared to a solar farm extreme buffer. That's it, John. Thank you. Oh, I, have uh, I, 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 I was going to ask Mr. Carter to make the uh, motion to approve the agenda, but he has a comment. That's what I was doing this for. <laughs> um, I'm a little confused as to why we have a provision in the, I think it's a statute, that says if the property is unconforming, is that what the term right? Um, non-conforming. Non that, um, a unit, I'm presuming there's already a mobile home on the property, correct? That unit goes unoccupied for either 90 or 180 days, apparently 180. 180 days is what the... Then you can't rent that apartment of that unit again? Well, if in the proposed ordinance, that's what it says. It says all existing parks will be labeled Legal non-conforming, I believe it's the exact word. It's legal non-conforming means we ain't going to come pull the meter today. But if it goes unused, it, it, it says there, there in the ordinance, if it goes unused, or basically when the meter pulls, let's say somebody moves the home, meter pulls. Power's cut off. Somebody moves the home. So if somebody, somebody takes the home out of it, it's a vacant lot then? It's a vacant lot. Say this, this say I'm renting your. Is this RV or this mobile home? That would be mobile home or RV. The way they're writing ordinances of, okay. is the way I understand. The way I read the ordinance, it says it's non-conforming due to these regulations, which is 3.2. I think there's another number back there. 3.23. Yeah. <laughs> if it's empty for 180 days, any non-conforming property, for any reason, and this I think this is countywide, not just us. It's done. You got to go back to, you would, the way I read the ordinance, you would have to go back to redoing the whole park to get get it back. And you'd have to come form the new ordinances. The, we don't the do brand that to new. houses. Huh? We don't do that to houses. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. That's, that's, I think House that's why we're here tonight. 80 days is just vacant for 180 days, right? It's, as long as it ain't vacant for over a year, right. then you just got to get electrical inspection. That's getting much right there. now, but, uh, Right, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the agenda. agenda. A motion to approve the agenda. Second. As amended with the changes that you've recommended? That is correct. Those changes being we struck the Sheriff's Department life-saving recipients. Um, and I think that's the about only... About the meeting thing, the yep. time of the meeting, like Deborah was talking about. You said you were going to do that during the business part. Right, but that will be a separate motion. Okay, sorry. Right. Uh, and motion second. I think Everybody in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Excellent. <clears throat> okay, the consent agenda, Mr. Turner. Motion to approve. Second. I thought you had a modification of the minutes. I did not. Okay. Hang on, okay. A yeah, motion to second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Excellent again. Okay, Mr. Haygood. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, Commissioners. Uh, next item on your agenda is considering the appointment uh, of a representative of the Board of Commissioners to the Alamance County 
Community College Board of Trustees. This is to fill an unexpired term. Uh, the unexpired term that you would be appointing an individual to will expire June 30th of 2022. We've received uh, three eligible applications. Those applications were in your packet and they were from Shannon Peterson, Catherine Smith, and Mark Gordon. And I believe, Mr. Chairman, we may have some of those folks uh, present with us this evening. If you, uh, Carol, I know I saw Mr. Gordon, I believe, is here. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if uh, Shannon Peterson or Catherine Smith are present with us this evening. Apparently not, but uh, we do have Mr. Gordon here. Appreciate his attendance. And uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, uh, the board can discuss and uh, consider these folks that have applied for this open position. John. I, I would like point to out that we only appoint one. There's only one yeah. vacancy. Yes. The vacancy was um, Craig Thompson, my husband, and he recently resigned. We've had a lot of questions about the fact that I serve on the county commissioners and would be voting on funding for ACC. I didn't stand to profit a dime, but just the appearance of it was a real conflict for us. So uh, Craig was gracious to um, resign. And, and that that's what it was. I didn't threaten him or nothing. <laughs> and, um, so, but he really enjoyed working with Algie Gatewood and the, and the board of trustees. Those are some really fine leaders in our county. We're very blessed to have them. And I know this group is going to be just as awesome. Well, I think the uh, uh, board of trustees appreciated his service also. Well, I can confirm for Ms. Thompson that we don't get a dime out of serving on the board of trustees <laughs> of the community college because we don't. Uh, and I serve as an appointee from the board, so uh, or for the board. Um, and uh, I'd like to, if a motion is in order, I would like to make a motion that we uh, appoint uh, Mark Gordon as the appointee to replace Mr. Thompson. I'll second that motion. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for your service, sir. Thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Cattle. Good evening, Commissioners. Y'all have on your agenda items tonight for a public hearing to be set. Uh, as Deborah was leading to earlier this evening, we've had discussions with current legal and public hearings are recommended. And I say recommended, you all make that decision for night meetings. That's very appropriate. Uh, you all have a list of five items on for the possible text amendments. What we'd like to do is keep four of those, which are some things that legal we're needing some things that staff was needing to uh, finish off part of the UDO. The number one thing was the RV park thing. If we could have that recommended to take that back to planning board. There's been a lot of discussion since planning board was heard it. They started redoing or looking at the RV part of the ordinance back in October. Uh, they came to their board board had more discussion in November and then December. They actually had some modifications and approved that. Uh, the non-conforming use section of the ordinance I've heard spoken about tonight, uh, that's as is. So if there's some recommended changes to that, that wasn't something that this board gave direction to that needed to be looked at, but maybe should be at this point. So we don't mind taking a look at that as well, but it sounds like pushing that back to planning board for discussion uh, and pulling that off of this list to move forward with public hearing at the end of February. Uh, as policy, it sounds like Deborah and myself agreed that we should have the public hearings at the evening meetings, we do have a portion of population that works in the evenings, but most of the population works during the day, so that would make it a good opportunity for them. And, and in your defense, uh, a lot of those, historically, we've run those at the next meeting subsequent to your board of, uh, planning board meeting. So Some things were more urgent and were pulled right. in, and that still can happen. This can be as policy, and there are exceptions to every policy, but we can set a standard policies. That way, when I'm done with the planning board meeting and somebody's gotten a vote, we know what to tell them. That's very appropriate. I'm going to make a motion. I talked to um, our county attorney as well this afternoon on this issue. Um, I'm going to make a motion that we have these uh, public hearings on the third meeting of the, excuse me, the second meeting of the month, which would be the third typically Monday. There are exceptions because of holidays and 
uh, weather and things of that sort. But go to the 6.30 meetings, the PM meetings, as opposed to the AM meeting. Uh, but this not be a hard rule, it's the general practice as opposed to putting it in stone. Okay, could you repeat that please? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, making a motion that we move public hearings of this sort uh, to the uh, second meeting of the month, which typically is a 6.30 p.m. meeting, um, subject to holidays, weather, uh, and emergencies. I'll second that motion. I just want to thank you for being so flexible and for literally listening. I appreciate all of us commissioners. We've gotten bombarded with emails because we're supposed to, and uh, we always need to listen to our folks in the community because um, if we don't know, we can't help you. And it's always important to contact us anytime. Um, Tanya's very hardworking and always wants to do the right thing, and I appreciate that. Absolutely. <clears throat> Any further discussion on my motion? Can I make an apology on your behalf? Uh-oh. What else? <laughs> you asked me to make a call to a couple of people today because you're, you were having techno technological problems. Oh, yeah. Several people have told me they were unable to reach our chairman. Uh, he's having, he's had some technological problems with his phone and um, his county phone. We're, be, we're fortunate enough to carry two phones now, guys. I hope you appreciate that. Um, but his phone's been being taken care of by the, or is being serviced by the IT department, and hopefully he'll be back in order. So it won't be, he'll be able to take all those phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was not and his voicemail will be fixed. Right? <laughs> I was funny. unable to take any, uh, if you left a voicemail, I simply did not receive it. This has been going on for about a week and a half, I guess. Uh, part of the delay is my fault, part of the delay is weather and so forth. Uh, additionally, I was not able to download any attachments. So even preparation for this meeting was delayed on my part uh, because I couldn't download the materials. Um, and so, Mr. Carter, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> He's trying to get me out of the doghouse. <laughs> Maybe you should talk to Mr. Kirby about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I do want to indicate it was not the IT department at all. They saved it. They saved my bacon yeah. instead of uh, cause. They, they did not cause the problem, uh, and Before they fixed it. Horizon, right? <laughs> I'm not blaming anybody. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Chairman, did you want me to address the issue of automatically having those public hearings so you don't have to constantly have them in the setting and the public understands what's going to happen yes that would be appreciated certainly uh, so again just as a quick reminder uh, what I talked about earlier but we think the prudent thing to do would be to have a vote right now would be to clarify that after a planning board meeting the matter would go to as you've just voted your second meeting on the third typically Monday, of course, always in accordance with the calendar that you adopt in December for the coming year and always, you know, posted and available online. But that way the public would know and the planning board would be able to tell them at the planning board meeting, we are making this recommendation, which will go to the board of commissioners next month at their 6.30 p.m. meeting. And that way the public always can plan and know what to expect. And I think there's been some confusion sometimes tonight, I think is a great example. Some of the public may have thought you were actually voting uh, on, on matters instead of actually just determining a public hearing. So that can get confusing. And by, by taking this step, I think you will help clarify things for the public. Additionally, uh, we did not vote to set the public hearing. Do we not need a motion to do that as well in item number two? Yes, that is what is remaining and I would ask you to do now that you no longer need to uh, have an agenda item to vote when to set the public hearing, that it would be in accordance with what I just put forth. 
So therefore, we do not need a second vote. Is that correct? You, you don't need to, you, you need a vote tonight to just clarify you will no longer receive on your agenda information about a coming public hearing and set it. It will just go to the next month from the planning board for your public hearing. All right. I'll make that motion as stated by our county attorney. I'll second that exactly same thing. <laughs> well, in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. It's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Haygood. Uh, commissioners, I'm representing the uh, uh, sheriff. He was unable to, to present this item to you, but your next item is a request that has two, two parts for the board to consider. Uh, Sheriff's Office is requesting that the commissioners consider the creation of a new deputy corporal position that would be in the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. This position would serve as additional security at RHA, at our Mental Health Crisis and Diversion Center. Uh, the reason being is that the hours are extending uh, at the uh, Crisis and Diversion Center from currently 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, the hours are going to be going to 8 a.m. till 12 midnight uh, seven days a week, necessitating the need for this new position. So the uh, items before you tonight are a vote to create the new position and also to budget the funding that would come from RHA to pay for this position. So RHA currently is paying for one deputy at, uh, at the uh, Diversion Center. They would uh, provide the county additional funding to pay for the second deputy position. Uh, in the package, you can see the, the different duties that the deputy uh, the current deputy provides. It would be the same duties of uh, the second deputy. I won't read those to you, but I will say we, of course, have uh, Chief Deputy Parker. We have Major Morris. With us here this evening we also have linda allison uh on uh, zoom that can speak to any questions you may have about the operations at the diversion center so this is a two-fold request one to create the position two to accept the funds from rha to pay the uh, new position salary so um, i'm happy to try to answer any questions and as we say we have uh, representatives from the sheriff's office uh, on zoom and here and there are no additional funds out of the county coffers that's correct that's right. Now, there's already one deputy assigned to that. I had a number of calls today and a, I think a couple of emails that indicated they thought we were putting law enforcement in the diversion center and that that was new. It's not new. We've had them there. This is this is because of expanded hours in the diversion center and um, from my knowledge and experience, uh, there is a need for there to be available uh, trained law enforcement in that facility because of people that come into the Virgin Center aren't always willing to be there. So. And I think also, uh, Commissioner Carter, this is important because as law enforcement brings individuals to the Diversion Center, they have to be able to drop those folks with a sworn officer. That's correct. So the officer comes in, spends very little time in the facility, is able to drop the person off to receive the care they need, but they have to turn that custody over to a law enforcement officer. So. You know, a lot of times the individual being brought in is brought in by another law enforcement agency in the county because of some issues that might have occurred it's a it's a it, we are very pleased the sheriff's office applied for and received the grant funding that's allowing the hours to be extended so uh you know originally the hours were eight to five it's changed from eight to eight now from eight till midnight seven days a week right. the goal long term is to have 24 hour availability but uh, appreciate the sheriff's office work on getting the uh, multi-year grant that pays for these um extra hours and uh but necessitates the need for this position. So I'll make a motion to approve the request. A second. I just got a question. This is for law enforcement. This person is not doing, is not a mental health behavior specialist. That's correct. They are not working one on one with clients that are in crisis. That that is my understanding. Uh, I think y'all officers. And so, who does that now? So uh, RHA has staff on, on site that are trained and equipped to deal with a mental health crisis. I mean the, the law enforcement aspect. Is there not law enforcement there while RHA is open? Yes, there is. And uh, because of the extended hours, it's requiring the addition of another person to cover the, uh, to cover the shifts. Yeah, 16 hours. Yes. And it has to be a corporal. 
I think there's a reason uh, behind the, the deputy corporal position. I don't know, uh, gentlemen, if y'all can speak to the rank. It's uh, experienced personnel that work there, and there's already a corporal position for the pay and structure okay. for the le uh, number of years that the uh, that the deputies serve there, and that's uh, that's why it's a corporal <coughs> position to meet the salary requirement because we're using existing experienced personnel. So I was going to ask you, you're going to take someone you've got now that's basically that person, just not in that address, and you're going to be moving them into that address. Yes, ma'am. We have uh, an experienced officer that's there now, and we have another one slated, <coughs> excuse me, to move into that position, then we will be able to backfill with new hires and uh, at a lower salary. Okay. And it's coming through grant and RHA funding. We're there for the statutory requirement of law enforcement and security. RHA provides the medical piece, the and, mental health piece. And how long is your grant for? Uh, Miss Allison's on Zoom, I believe it's three years. That's correct, Cliff. Chief Deputy is for three years. So after three years, we'll try for renewal of that grant. If not, then the county pays for that, right? Yes, that is correct. And I think uh, you know these would be costs that would need to be discussed with VIA as we talk about the possibility of moving into right. enhanced diversion. So uh, you know the key would be to always keep law enforcement on present. Uh, to receive these people when the uh, law enforcement officers bring them. That, that's required. So yeah, additionally, RHA, I think their contract expires within the next couple of years. So we constantly have renegotiations with VIA, with uh, RHA, with all these people. So that's part of the continuing <coughs> contractual obligations. Yes. Well, I can't support the representation of law enforcement being there enough because if you've ever been in the emergency room, and seeing law enforcement come in with someone that's either been shot or something and they're handcuffed to their bed and it is just and it's, it is a just chaotic situation and I wouldn't want to put that on any social worker or any mental health provider I, I want law enforcement because that's what they do to do well all about safety no matter who it is safety that's the key okay any other discussion all in favor signify by saying aye, aye. aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. I guess we have our... Yeah, Mr. Atkins coming up next. He'll be joining us by Zoom, Zoom sir. Good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me? Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. I've been told that I have a, a, an unusually good voice this evening. Uh, which is the reason that I'm on Zoom instead of in the middle of a public meeting. I hope that nobody minds. Uh, what I have for you today, let me see if I can share a screen so that we can look at the same thing. Let's see here. Are you seeing my presentation? We do, yes. So what this is, uh, is a uh, proposal following up on our previous uh, meetings. And I want to thank you for the opportunity last time to uh, kind of pick your brain and, and, and see how you felt about some of the options that we have out there. Uh, tonight, I want to make my recommendations as to what I think we should do uh, based on the information and the, the situation at hand. Uh, to start out, I'd like to share a, uh, a slide that I, I've seen years ago in a class. And it's the good, fast, or cheap triangle. And the rule is you can usually get two of the three. So you can get something good really fast. It probably won't be cheap. You can get something uh, cheap really fast, but it probably won't be good. And you can get good things cheap, but you're going to have to wait for it. And so those three forces are always pulling at each other. Uh, my philosophy has been with the reevaluation, we have a minimum quality standard we have to meet. We have to maintain that. And we have a minimum timeline that we have to meet. We have to maintain that. And within that framework, my question was, how cheap could I go? And that was always my interest, and I'm trying to, to be aware that this is taxpayer money, and we need to be careful with it. Um, I agree with the board's concern about uh, knowing what the tax base is going to be at the time that the budget goes into place, that we could have a lot of appeals. 
and the need to, to find ways to get more of those processed by the time that uh, decisions are being made. So we're going to prioritize a little bit more fast, and I don't want to give up good. So we're going to talk about what that's going to cost. So my priorities in this proposal, first of all, to maintain quality at a high standard, to resolve enough appeals to confidently determine revenue neutral, and not to break the bank. Uh, I am still mindful of what things cost. So I think our goal uh, reasonably should be to finish by January 15th, 2023. Uh, to do that, we need to add additional staff to reduce the time required to complete the project. The staff will be sourced from the current vendor, Vincent Valuations. Uh, staying with the one vendor will, will allow for quicker implementation and better coordination. Um, also, they have an excellent reputation, and they offered us the lowest quotes for staff support during their initial bid, so I think the pricing is good. The Vincent staff will be tasked with supporting in-house appraisers, and this will allow our in-house staff to dedicate more time to the revaluation. Uh, but it also keeps the valuations done locally. Our staff will be doing the valuation. Uh, they're going to be assisted by Vincent, not replaced by Vincent. Um, all outsourced work will be under the final review of in-house staff. So to do this, the cost of additional staff is estimated at $5,500 per month. Uh, the budgetary period will include March 1st through June 30th. So that's a period of four months. That means the cost for the 21-22 budgetary period would be $22,000. The good news is that this amount is already available in the current budget. So nothing new needs to be done regarding that tonight. We've got the money to accomplish that. Um, we will, of course, need to continue that expenditure into next year. And a balance of $44,000 will be budgeted in the 2022-23 uh, budget period. This will go through the regular process. This is nothing unusual. But when my budget comes in, you'll just see that this is included in the budget. Another thing that we need to consider is the poss possibility of having to rework some neighborhoods. Should the market shift in unpredictable ways, which would not necessitate postponing the revaluation, but would require significant reworking of earlier values additional help will be sought from Vincent. Now the exact amount of help required will be determined by the extent of reworking and the time remaining. An allowance of an additional $66,000 will be made for this work. And this amount will appear in the 22-23 budget. So again, right now, that's not a concern. I'm letting you know about it because when my budget comes in through the normal process, uh, I will include this amount in. I'm hoping not to spend it, but I would rather have it available and not spend it than not have it available and need to spend it. Another area of concern is appeal support. It is advisable to double the level of support during the appeals period to allow staff to process more appeals per week. The cost of additional staff is estimated at $11,000 a month. This will cover a period of February 1st through May 30th uh, of next year, of 2023, a period of four months, and that's a cost of $44,000. This also will appear in the 22-23 budget. Again, that's not a budgetary concern tonight. It will go through the ordinary budgetary process. I'm just making you aware that, that that's something I plan to request. And again, what this is for is to allow our staff to do nothing but process appeals. So when we get to that stage, when the value notices are out for revaluation, the appeals are coming in, if we want to get to a bottom line, we want every bit of our resources going towards resolving those appeals as quickly as possible. We could get a good lead by starting at January 15th and lose that lead if we don't process the appeals quickly. And so we want to maximize that. Uh, beyond that, we talked about software, um, and I am of the opinion that citizen-facing software can help to streamline the appeal process. It can lead to quicker resolutions of appeals. It can also help to head off some appeals, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, millennials. I mean, I, you know, all age demographics uh, use our online services right now, but with the, the millennial uh, group, 
uh, the, the desire to research it online, process it online, and conclude it online uh, it is very real. And so to make sure that we have an ability to respond to that, I think, is, is in our best interest. Um, three options are currently under review. Uh, Spatialists, we talked about that at the last meeting. And I chose them just because they had some, uh, some good videos just to give you a quick look at, at what this is. Uh, Esri, which is a major competitor, and we also have in-house software that I want to touch on briefly. Uh, in short, uh, Spatialist has been the dominant pr product in the space, uh, implementing their full citizen-facing suite of software would have a year one cost of $64,000, with subsequent years reduced to $42,000. Esri, the, the big competitor, is the dominant company for GIS technology. They have been aggressively entering the citizen-facing software space. They've been very successful due to implementation with COVID dashboards. Uh, their citizen-facing began with the COVID crisis and getting information out there. At the time of this report, the uh, quote was not yet available. Uh, we do think it will be less than what Spatialist is, is quoting. And we currently have software that does this. For the 2017 revaluation, we developed our own product. Uh, we would plan to use this software if no other product is selected, and there's no additional cost to it. And I want to make sure that the board is aware. I don't want to mislead the board into thinking that we don't have something in place right now. We do. Uh, it, it is something that was developed between myself and the programmer from U.S. Tax Data, who puts a lot of our information online, they're a web services vendor. Uh, we did get some help from Marlena Isley and, and GIS, and the product looks like this. When somebody uh, wants to research their parcel, they can put in their parcel number, and they're taken to a screen that looks like this. It attempts to find comps for them and adjust those comps and suggest to them a likely range of values. It tells them if they think that they're well supported, high or low. If they want to see where the comparables are, they can click, uh, click the button to map the parcels and they can see where the comparables are. If they want to file an appeal, there's one button click and they can file their appeal to process that online. Um, now, I'm, I'm a proud papa. I designed this, I worked very hard on this and it does what it does well. And the advantage is we've already paid for it. There's no additional cost. And as somebody that likes to pinch a penny, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, the concern that I have here, if I'm going to be honest with you, is that, one, it is not the same standard as the publicly available software. Um, I am not a software developer. Uh, neither is the, the website vendor, uh, the programmer I work with there. That's not what we do. And so this is very basic. Um, additionally, the company that maintains this for us has one program. And in my business, you have to think about what happens. We're one uh, automotive accident away from not having this product because we've got one program. Um, if you go with one of the other companies, you've got teams of programmers with an international company that have professionally designed the software. So that's why I'm considering additional software, but we, we do have this. This is workforce so far. What I'm recommending is just continue reviewing those options. I want to get more information from Esri especially because they didn't have numbers ready for me. Um, if they make a compelling case, then in the upcoming budget, I'm going to request that as part of the budget. Um, if they don't impress me, then we'll just stay with the in-house solution. Uh, cheap is, is attractive to me, um, but I, I just think it's worth considering. So, so letting you know it's out there, letting you know that you may see an ask with the budget coming up, or if, if the numbers don't work for me, you may not see that ask at all, um, but following up on that. So to put everything in, in summary, right now for the 21-22 budget year, what we need is the redial support from Vincent Valuations. It's 22,000, and we've already got that in the budget. No, no budget item here. For 22-23, we would need the, the remainder of that support is $44,000. Appeal support, $44,000. I want an allowance for reworking of 66,000. We hope not to spend, but I want to have available. 
maybe the customer facing software. So we're looking right now at 176,000 in the coming budget year, uh, plus possible software. If we don't have to do a rework, it's 110,000 plus possible software. And again, that, that'll all be handled through the regular budget process. I'm just letting you see uh, what would I plan to, to bring up in that budget based on the, the meetings that we've had so far and the goal of, of getting as many appeals resolved as possible so that we have a more stable tax base. We know what it is that we're budgeting based on. Um, do, do you have any questions for me? Jeremy, what does rework a neighborhood mean? That sounds kind of scary. Are you telling people all of a sudden well, they're millionaires? It is, it is kind, of, kind of scary. Let me uh, see if I can get my picture back here. Hello. Uh, so with reworking the neighborhood, uh, what has happened is that the work was done early in the process. Let's say we begin in March. So we work a neighborhood in March. But the value is supposed to be as of January 1st of the coming year. So we have to guess where the market will be then. And that's normally not difficult. If you're off by a percentage or two, it's really no harm. You're very close. Uh, last year, though, we tracked a 20% market change in 10 months. We would never have guessed that. And that would put us far too low. Back in the 2009 evaluation, we had a market uh, decline because it crashed. We did not anticipate a crash. And so we were far too high. Um, if the market does something like that, and it's not severe enough that we put on the brakes, because this board, by the center of this year, can say, wait, stop, push back a year, or it can put on the brakes. But if we don't, and the market has swung high or low, we have to go back to that early work and redo it. We cannot send out those, those March neighborhoods much higher and much lower than those December neighborhoods. We have to have equalization. Um, that changes our timeline. The, the concern is if we have to go back and redo early work because the market was higher or lower than we thought, now we're late. And, and we really want to stick with that January 15th. We don't want to let it run out into February, March, April, however long. So should that occur, we need additional staff to scramble so that we can do that rework and stay on schedule. Does the Vincent evaluation people, um, do they have like all this staff that we're just going to be able to get? They have sufficient staff for what we need. Now the key is that we would be doing the revaluation part. What we would be doing is handing off all of our routine duties to Vincent. So if you've got a new home under construction, they can go out and they can uh, sketch the home, get all the information, get all the pictures, get everything set up for us and bring that back to us, freeing up our staff to continue working through and redoing the neighborhood. So it really, we're looking just for, for an extra staff person, maybe two, they, they can handle that. It, it's not a whole team of people, uh, but, but we may need one or two additional persons to come in last minute so that we can be all rebound all the time. You're the only one up here shaking your head because you know all of us. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking, what is he talking about? Okay. Bill's got you back. If you need any help, he's that's available. The, that's the, probably the biggest downfall of your whole job right now is having to rework a neighborhood. That, mm -hmm. that can become costly and time-consuming. Yes, exactly. Mr. Atkins, at this point, you simply want our nod to continue on. Is that correct? Because you've got well, to cover for this year. That, and that's what I'm seeking, is with the board's blessing, my plan uh, tomorrow morning is to contact Vincent and begin the process of expanding the contract, bring on the additional support. But before I contact them, I want to make sure that the board is uh, approving of me going forward. We don't need a vote on this, but uh, we have a one thumbs up, a shaking the head yes. Uh, the chair says yes. Oh, yeah. I'm, with, I'm, with you. I'm just whatever y'all think. Because <laughs> I trust Jeremy. I, I yeah. think you have a 5 he's, he's 5 0 vote. <laughs> a 5 0 9 vote. Don't, don't be working, reworking my neighborhood. That's all I'll say. <laughs> don't be coming near no Delaney Drive. <laughs> we will do our very best. Scott or, or 
Ms. Bechtel, I, I'm in agreement with the chair. I don't think a vote's required, but just <clears throat> to make certain, can we get some uh, I agree. legal advice? And, yes, I agree a vote is not necessary okay. for that. It's, your head nod works. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Basically, what we're saying is it's covered financially in our current budget Correctly. for this year. And next year's budget, uh, we have not even put together yet. So we'll have to anticipate those monies coming out of our budget for next year. Right. Okay. <laughs> Assistant County Manager, <laughs> Ms. Hook. Thank you, uh, John. John, take yeah. After. After. I'm going after. Yeah. I'm good either way. After's fine. Right. <laughs> sure. Drag it out. All right. Oh, no, I'm going to make it quick. Dance. We're going to go quick. <laughs> um, so what I've got before you is a few months ago, we put out a request for qualifications for um, design services for the new court admin building and the remodel of J.B. Allen. So we um, selected CRA associates and we were in the process of coming up with a um, contract with them. Then we had the work session um, back, I think, December 10th. And we kind of, coming off of that work session, decided that we needed to go a little bit different route with them and do more pre-planning with them. So what you see in front of you is not the full um, execution of the contract that would take us from um, concept all the way through design and ready to put out the bid for um, services or the bid to build but what you've got is just a contract in front of you that does the pre-work and this would be talking with the stakeholders determining our space needs because I think there was a lot of discussion about I think we initially we'd said a 3100 a 31,000 square foot building a lot of discussion that that may not be large enough. So what we've asked is for CRA to come in and do pre-work. They would not come in with the design, but rather they'll do space planning and um, blocking space to give us an idea of, of all of the people we want to put in the building, how big does the building need to be, what does the footprint look like, where we're planning to put it, is that the optimal place for it? So to answer some of these questions before we go a lot further with the um, design of the building. I actually have people from CRA are here, um, David Taylor, Ken Redfoot, and Julia Stil Silbert, if you want to ask them any questions. Otherwise, you see the um, contract for those services. They will start very quickly, and the proposed fee is $156,800. Okay. You remember Craig had mentioned something about possibly the existing courthouse become the offices, mm -hmm. and we build the courthouse spec to whatever okay, we would need. So that's is that why on, the, are... on the paper too, something like that? Okay. Yes. So I had them go back and actually watch the work session so they could oh, hear good. all of those, all of those <laughs> and thoughts you came? about the building. <laughs> Thanks. We're surprised you showed up. <laughs> yeah, one real concern I have um, is probably because I've been hanging around too long. <laughs> uh, when we did the jail, for example, we had uh, one architect, a different engineer, a different whatever, and then, of course, when there were problems, everybody pointed fingers at each other. I want to make sure that our contracts and everything are, uh, we look at you guys primarily, and there is no shifting off at a later point, uh, blaming some other. We expect you guys to keep up with the project and make sure that everything is on target. Um, and that's a major concern that I have. The second thing, um, Initially, the two-story construction, uh, when I started practicing law in 1973, October 1973, they were discussing a courthouse complex and the expansion and how inadequate and nothing was done. And then in the 80s or 90s, a uh, visiting judge ordered us to make expansions. And under the gun, the county had to do it. Um, and again, the planning was right here. It was not out here. 
So I want to make sure that we don't plan for today only. We plan for far enough ahead that we can make this thing work for the future as well as the present. Uh, and I think particularly that site, uh, I'm sure you're going to do all kinds of studies and uh, what's under the ground and whether it's whatever. Um, but I'm thinking three to four stories at a minimum in order to grow. With no That's jail space mm -hmm. over any office space. We've <laughs> had enough of that, correct? That's, a, that's part of that lawsuit <laughs> in, with the other folks that we had before. <laughs> and I say we, none of us were on the uh, commissioners at that time. So uh, we don't want to revisit that, obviously. I just think you're awesome because coming off the school board and plans for all of our upgrades and build a school, it's like even down to the type of doorknob. I've never seen anything like that in my life. It's, I know y'all got somebody locked in the basement that draws all this stuff. And I, you're just so talented. You are just so enormously talented. I, I just think it's amazing. It really is. What it comes to be whenever you see it hit the ground. That's pretty awesome. Mr. Turner, so, comment. Just a question about the um, proposed schedule. I see that it, the idea is that it'll be three months from the day of the contract, approximately. Mm -hmm. Do we have a sense of when? Oh, my cut off. <laughs> uh, my three minutes are up. <laughs> uh, when the information gathering begins, when, when the actual design work begins, and when the reporting begins. We have a sense of of what that is. So I don't know, but yeah, Just we have talked. Yeah, or? yeah. Come on up here. We've talked at length about this. Yeah, uh, I'm David Taylor. I'm, I'll be the project architect. I'm a partner with CRA. Um, we'd like the the information gathering to start virtually tomorrow. Okay. Um, and that would uh, the information gathering part is um, more geared towards the existing facility. Uh, working with facilities, working, uh, getting as many drawings, existing drawings as possible, um, touring the building, uh, making sure that the drawings that we, we do have actually matches what is currently on the ground. We also then have to go back and do a lot of computer work because I don't assume that any of this is in AutoCAD or any, uh, any kind of uh, graphic right. representation, so right. we have to go back and do a lot of um, drawing ourselves just to create a base plan of what's what's already there so that we know if this if this group is moving over here you know who's going to be over in their existing space you guys have done some work on this previously haven't you with interviews with stakeholders that kind of thing uh no we have not okay um this is uh there was some work done and i'll, I'll have to uh, about five years ago there was some work done some um some space planning done, but if you'll recall, I mean, it's completely different people now. There was some, wasn't there a committee set up where there was some input given? Was it just a county staff? The, we've was had uh, several years ago. We, I mean, in the last like three or four months, so we, we did have a. I'm we sorry. did. Um, we did meet with judicial partners, and we had the a county. Did. Gosh, the county did, okay. and we had probably a half a day work session. And so we have a lot of their input already. And we have those notes already. Okay. Yes. And then what he what they will do is go back and meet with meet with those departments individually. Because what we brought gave him was more of a compilation of the thoughts that were given that day. Right. But there needs to be more discussion with um, each department and, and what they feel their individual needs are. Just for clarity, uh, all the judges were involved, the clerk's office was uh, Ms. Edwards were involved. Uh, the Sheriff's Department was involved to some extent. Uh, I was involved and um, some of the other attorneys were involved, the President of the Bar Association. Uh, so it was a pretty widespread committee. Uh, and it's a good, very broad document. Right. What we need to do is now get down into the details of how many clerks do you have? How many, how many bailiffs do you have? What kind of space do they need? Um, so that we can design the building. And wh what she mentioned earlier was the idea of doing space planning and um, the, the, the contract you have in front of you is to bring the project to what I will call a conceptual design level so that we can establish exactly what the square footage is going to be, probably how many floors it'll be, where it'll be, but it won't have any real architectural 
quality to it. It'll be more kind of bubble diagrams, um, uh, layered drawings of, of maybe the, the clerk's office on the ground floor, DA's office on the second floor, new criminal courts on the third floor, if that's what's decided. Um, you know, those kinds of things. It's not going to have, you're not going to see beautiful renderings or, or anything like that at this point. Um, the beautiful renderings come later. The beautiful renderings come <laughs> later. Darn <laughs> so, And additionally, um, yeah, the judges particularly talked about we are at least one one district court judge short mm -hmm. of all our surrounding county, Orange County, which is smaller than us, for example, um, and so forth. So we know we're going to need at least one more additional district court mm -hmm. um, we're talking about the drug court and so forth that really can't happen until we have more space um, so and I think these folks already we've already talked to them to some extent about these needs yes in the group. and and the, the work session I know one of the judges uh, uh, spoke extensively at the work session and we we've, we've watched all of that and so we're uh, we've got a good base of information we we just need to get a lot more detail okay and when you present in three months, thereabouts, will you be able to have a, a rough cost range? Yes, that that will be part of. Uh, we will provide a uh, a magnitude of cost um, for any of the concepts that we come up with, right. whether it's two stories that's bigger or three yeah. stories that's smaller. We will put some. We will put costs to that, um, and we've got we we hire a professional cost estimator that assists us in doing that. And on the sheriff's behalf, we can't say it too many times. Am I correct, Cliff? No office space under detention space. <laughs> <laughs> We've been around that one too many times. Yeah. Uh, well, it'll be very. I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, you know the, these meetings because they. Um, uh, I don't know. For for me personally, it's it's kind of like getting a uh, a degree in social work because you learn. <laughs> I've already been through this a couple of times already, but you learn all about the different mm -hmm. positions and and uh, uh, all the different uh, procedures uh, in in judicial uh, in the judicial system. So it's very exciting for us. Just for clarity, I want the audience that is out there in Zoom land or wherever. Uh, we are not talking about the jail. We're talking about an addition to the J.B. Allen complex. Correct. Despite what Mr. Carter keeps talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's one more thing I would say is that make sure we think about the juries. The I've juries? Been, juries. I've been mm -hmm. in many courthouses where where the jury is in relation to everybody else is not well thought out. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of potential for, for cross-contamination mm -hmm. between lawyers and juries. Yeah. I mean, do we want to keep the, just think about that when you're... Uh, the J.B. Allen courthouse was, uh, yeah. I, I, I know it's a, it's a, a good build, it, well, okay. it was designed, I, I, I liken it a lot to the first Charlotte Coliseum was built right before luxury boxes became the thing in the NBA and all these kinds of things. And so it sat out there on Billy Graham Parkway, and it had none of those facilities. Well, the J.B. Allen is a, is a lot the same. It was built in 1996. 2001 came along, and security just became a whole different animal. And so you just built that courthouse at a time when there was a significant shift in how, how justice is meted out in terms of security, in terms of uh, isolating this person from this person, making sure that, you know, inmates are not, uh, you know, inter uh, connected with people they shouldn't be before uh, their appearance in court, things of that nature. So uh, it's, it'll be a challenge, but we're, we're lo really looking forward to it. Same comment, uh, same line. Uh, right now, everybody at that facility goes through one single line. Mm -hmm. Uh, the lines outside doesn't matter whether it's snowing, sleeting, raining, you know, whatever, and you've got jurors and defendants and victims and everybody all mingled together. And I hope that's not going to be the case in the future. Well, that is certainly one of the things we'll be looking at. Thank you. Is uh, how to how to make the the security of that courthouse much better. 
Mr. Carter, any questions? Mr. Lashley? No, sir. Ms. Thompson? No. Okay, thank you, thank you. And we thank you. So I am asking for um, approval to spend this $156,800. And the funding for this would come from capital reserves. And we've got that plan for the capital funds anyway. Yes. Motion to approve. So I, got, I have one question, just the basics of the um, you said it's coming out of capital reserve fund. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the uh, balance is on that? The current balance uh, is three million eight hundred and seventy-two thousand nine hundred and eighty-four dollars and seventy-two cents. Perfect. <laughs> I was close. <laughs> <laughs> That's not that twenty-some million fund mm -hmm. balance. No, and I this thought. is not the three point eight million from right. the ARP uh, mm -hmm. uh, supplant either. So. Right. Thank you. Sure, do have a lot of funds. <laughs> There are many funds, and I'm glad that we have people that are able to uh, differentiate between all of them. Amazing. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> You're up again. Are we taking a break we, first? No, let's ready? talk. Go you ahead. Break. Talk okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Watch him do the dance. <laughs> so, what, just a few minutes? We're going to take a 10 minute break, guys. Okay. Thank you. Back in session. I'm back. All right. So, what you see before you is um, a request to extend our emergency paid sick leave. So if you'll remember um, back when COVID started, there was uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act allowed up to two weeks of paid sick leave for an employee that was unable to work because they were quarantined or having COVID symptoms. Um, that ended Back December 31st of 2020, we came to the board and asked if we could extend that. We extended it through June, came back at, in August, asked again, extended it through December. We really thought that that would um, be enough for us, but as you can see, we're starting to have a lot of employees that are out sick. So what we're asking is that we extend that again, and we extend it through the end of June. And this would be 80 hours of paid sick leave, but it would not be an additional 80 hours. So it's 80 hours from that uh, time period of last January through this coming June. So if you've used it, used your 80 hours, you don't get an additional. And this really helps those employees that are new employees that have not had an opportunity to accrue a lot of sick and vacation time. Right. So what we're trying to do is, if people are sick, we don't want you in the workplace. So, if you are a county employee and you t and you call in and say I'm, I got COVID, do you have to show proof of that? Is um, that allowed? You know what I'm saying? You just don't say because trust me, we have little people that visit the jail all the time. Say so I got the COVID, mm -hmm. and about 15 times <laughs> and no was the call continue my case in court yeah so i'm just curious how that works not violating anybody's privacy right. or anything so we have not been asking for anything to confirm that mm -hmm. you have a positive test but again we're only doing 80 hours i mean we're you can't do it this all the time so you have a limit of 80 hours and that is pa through the past year and a half okay cumulative cumulative yes mm-hmm you don't get a free 80 hours, you, but I mean, you get 80 hours total, but if you get it. sick, we don't say, oh, you need to be out for two weeks. You would be out the quarantine period that CDC recommends at the time. Which is and it does not five remain. days, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How much? 13? 10. 10. 10. That's what he says. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> 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 
Okay, are we getting some conflicting? Uh, are we uh, getting? Tony, what is the what what is the quarantine for COVID so right now? Is it isolation is, um, is five days, um, and then um, you have to wear a mask for five additional days. But if you're moderate to severe, those five days could actually be longer, ten or twenty days. No, it's just close to what you're saying. Yes, sir. So for my so we, we have to do 10 because of the detention center. Uh, we're required to be out 10, and because patrol personnel have anybody could the sheriff's office is subject has to come into the detention center. So we're required a 10 10 day leave. Is that a sheriff's department requirement or a state requirement or? It's state state, and we we confer with our with our health nurse, and because of the detention center, we're required to do so. We. The sheriffs that had to make it a 10 day because otherwise you would have to ice you know put yourself five days put yourself in an office away from somebody for or wear a mask yeah. so we're just trying to do the 10 days to meet our standards in the detention center so. okay. you recommending 80 hours yes motion to approve second any discussion on a favor, Senator? Oh, I'm sorry. Quick question. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Ms. Hook, um, so eligible leave qualifications subject to a quarantine, um, health providers saying that you must be quarantined or at high risk. The third, these are or statements, so mm -hmm. the, that or that or the, or the employee is showing symptoms of COVID-19 and is actively seeking but has not yet received a medical diagnosis. That, my, my concern, I'm not saying we change this, but my concern is that with Omicron these days, I mean, a sniffle, there, there's a lot of Omicron. There's a lot of light mm -hmm. symptoms Omicron. A sniffle feels a whole lot like a cold, a whole lot like just being stopped up. So um, what does it mean that you're actively seeking a medical diagnosis? from the county's perspective. So it means that you're trying to find a testing site. What about if you just have a home kit? Would that suffice for a medical diagnosis? So we have not been using that, but we can talk with the health department about that. But we have been going by, you're, you're going to a facility and getting the test. The positive rate on a, on a home test is pretty accurate, is it not? Yes. I mean, if, if you're positive, the, 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 that's pretty accurate information. I am I know that those are in short supply right now, but it seems if we could if we, we could have, have that as an supply option. supply of those, but. Well, that would speed up, that would speed up the, the process for mm -hmm. people. I've got a sniffle, I'm concerned. I just want to know yes or no. If we can do home kits, that, that helps out everybody, I think. I also wonder if the county can purchase mm -hmm. home kits such that if, we're, if there's problems in the community, if we have a certain allotment here, you can get a quick answer as well, so, particularly for, yeah. for patrol and for people who are really, really need an answer. So we tried, I mean, we did have home kits here for a while and then I think they were recalled. So we, um, so we were, that was our intent was mm -hmm. to be able to, if you come to school, to come to work and you have the sniffles, right. you could come up and get a home kit. Right. So, um, I, mean, I think that would give everybody a lot of confidence mm -hmm. you know I, mean, I can stay or i really need to go i mean it's just it's something that we can definitely do and i would imagine it's something that we could pay for through pandemic response funds right. i think i'll be talking with uh tell me about it. between our pandemic funding and any funding that uh help might have if that would be applicable we could find a way to pay for those kids to me this policy makes the board too yeah. i mean i have a family member who got a home care test kit the day after becoming symptomatic, showed up negative, continued to travel, got home, got tested again after becoming really sick, tested positive, spent about 12 days flat on her back. And then I have another family member who, younger, um, tested or came down with symptoms on Sunday, tested positive on Monday, is asymptomatic today. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's all over the board. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it helps the county. I think it helps the employee, uh, both the, who may have symptoms and those around the employee, if we can have some rapid tests. We can do that. If we can find them, we yeah. can do yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. That's the deal I hear. I'll bring you a couple. We don't have there, one. You're pretty, okay. I, don't know. I think I know. I one. do too. <laughs> And, and with that, I, I can I can support this. Thank you. 
Are you making a motion? We already have it. Thank you. We don't have or a motion and a second. And a second. second. Yep. Excellent. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Unanimous. Yes, sir. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fun, <sir. laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, Chairman Paisley, Vice Chair Carter, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to come before this evening to talk about uh, COVID. And since I have the opportunity, I was, of course have to give my shout out to the public health <laughs> folks and the staff. They're just amazing every day, especially over the last couple of weeks. As you're here, there's been a lot of changes surrounding guidance for quarantine and isolation and vaccination, um, as well as preparing for a, a storm event. So they've had to do a lot of pivoting, a lot of planning, um, and just doing such a wonderful job. So I got I to get that point out there. I might indicate that the emergency status which I signed, which went into effect Saturday night, is no longer in effect. Yes. Well, probably will we'll come back into effect on Thursday. Is that yeah. <laughs> you just stay up. Wait till Friday. With the health department, do you have any lime soap you can wash it? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before you is our, our current cases. So where it says. Uh, New cases there, 1,558. That's just not all the cases that, that occurred today. This is actually over the last three days. Um, as you're aware, they, um, we've had so many uh, cases coming in, it has just overwhelmed our, our nursing and our investigative team. So we've uh, really went from live time reporting to a little bit more of a delayed reporting so the folks can get caught up, um, have some weekend time with their families, and then, and then start right back at it during the week. So we've been working with IT to make sure those judgments to our dashboards are relevant and be as live time as possible um, with our reporting. Um, so 43 active cases in the, the hospital, 398 deaths uh, cumulative. Uh, the chart there, I know it's hard to see on the, on the right-hand side. Um, kind of what I want to point out here. So the, on the top there is from the whole month of December. There's a total of 2,816 cases. This is the time where really the transition is starting to occur from the Delta variant over to the Omicron variant, being that dominant variant out there. Um, our, the just 60 percent of our cases are still in that 25 to 49 age group and zero to 17. So that's the bulk of our cases that are coming. So not much has changed there. Fast forward to the first 18 days of uh, January, we've had 7,793 cases. So a lot of cases are, are coming in. And this really, you know, I know it's kind of hard, well, I guess it's not too hard to see. You kind of see the, um, the little curve there, and then there's a second little bump, and then you see right at Christmas time there, we just, we just rock it up. I mean, it just takes off. So I'm curious to see how this kind of curve looks if it looks a little curtotic and, and has a, a long and narrow uh, uh, look to it we'll see as things start to die down uh, over time here it just bumped all the way up to what so we're, we're, we're seeing we're seeing hundred yeah so we're seeing on average um, per day about 632 cases coming in right now um, I remember back in the day we thought 140 was a lot of cases coming in mm -hmm. so we're seeing on average 632 cases so this is a point in time, just kind of a current snapshot from first 18 days of January this year to the first 18 days of uh, 2021 there. And so again, the case counts. So last year, January 11th was our peak day of that of that surge. Um, that was first 18 days, there was 2,330 cases. Obviously, as I just mentioned, the um, number of cases for the first 18 is well over 7,000 um, with that. But one thing I do want to point out in this slide is um, if you look at our 65 and older uh, group there, last year at this time we were just starting the vaccination uh, effort um, really with that population. This is our high risk population uh, in this age group and they made up double digits percentage. So 18% of the uh, cases that were coming in last year um, now they're the most robust age group, as we'll see here in a little bit, that are uh, fully vaccinated. And they make up 7% of the cases. And that's been, been pretty consistent since the latter half of last year. They're right around that 7, 8, 9% of the cases that are coming in. How are our um, senior facilities doing? Because I know of one, because my friend's got a relative at, I'm not going to mention any names, that um, it's just all through it, which is it's going to one roof. I don't yeah. care what you do. It's going to kind of just, you know, go down the halls. 
And I'm just curious if that population is yet again another sitting duck because that's the biggest of our deaths. So we'll talk about that here in a second, but okay, there's 14, 14, okay, 14 outbreaks um, in long-term care okay. or residential facilities um, right now. So the metrics that we've uh, I've used historically are per 1,000 uh, over seven days cases, and that's currently at 2,353 cases. And then our percent positivity rate is at 33%. So one third of the tests out there are testing positive. Question: How do we? How are, when we if you take a COVID test, how do we determine whether it's the original COVID, the Delta variant? Or the Omicron variant. Yeah. So um, we we don't determine that, and the state doesn't necessarily determine that. So what they'll do is they'll take samples, random samples from the test, and they'll send them to a CDC approved um, lab, and they'll run to see which variant is dominating current strain, so on and so forth, any new variants, and they'll sequence those tests. And so then, we are seeing that, that the one that's hitting Alamance County right now is Omicron. Is Omicron ninety ninety five percent of the cases in the south. East are the Omicron virus, Southeast United States, ninety-five percent. So Omicron is the dominant variant. Yep. So this slide, I know it's it's pretty busy. Um, it's just looking at the death rates from twenty twenty-one, and it has twenty twenty twenty-two on there. Obviously, we've just started twenty twenty-two, but it tells a little bit of a story. Um, so the the top in twenty twenty. Um, our first case was March 20th of, of 2020, um, and uh, I knew that person by the yeah. way. And, the and uh, early on, as you may recall, uh, it got into our long-term care facilities fast um, and spread. And in that year, we had 204 deaths. Um, out of that 204, 117 of those were from long-term care facilities. So just just close to 60 percent of the deaths came from long-term care facilities. Uh, fast forward to, and, and the vast majority, 75 and older, there's 135 deaths, and 65 to 74, there are 41 deaths um, that year. Fast forward 2021, there were a total of 177 deaths, but long-term care facility deaths uh, made up 25%, so 45 out of 177 that year were long-term care facility deaths. You also saw the number from 75 and older, so it, the year prior was 135, and 2021, 81, 88 were 75 and older. You didn't really see a change in deaths from 65 to 74, uh, but you did see a little few more deaths in 55 to 64, the 40 to 54 range, and the 20 to 39. Um, so you saw 75 and older come down. That piece. Do we have a percentage for the so for the overall death rate of those infected? So in in 2020, the overall death was 1 1.85 1 percent. In 2021, it was 0.9%. So it went down? So it went down. And so we don't, what, what are we looking like here today with Omicron? So, um, of course, that's short. Way, yeah. But a lot of infections. So, we, yeah, obviously, we just started. Um, 2022, we've had a total of eight deaths um, since the 1st of January. Um, one of those has um, came from a long term care facility. And so, in, those, in that of those eight, they were 65 and older. All eight were. For 65 and older. Uh, underlying health conditions? I do not know, but most likely so. Um, I mean, that's pretty consistent age. Underlying uh, health conditioners, diabetes, cardiac disease has been pretty consistent. Throughout I threw a number out to you this morning. We had a meeting this morning, and I threw a number out that I had heard the CDC say that 75% of the deaths had four underlying health conditions. Yeah, I, I, I can't say conclusively. I haven't seen any studies, but I think anecdotally, knowing obesity, diabetes, cardiac has been tied to a lot of these deaths, and of course, age or correlated or associated with it. Right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. So this is our, our Cone Health data that comes from their website um, and their hospitalization. Um, I guess two things I want to really take away from this slide. Obviously, with the high numbers, I think it's reasonable to suspect we also see high demand on our health care systems, folks getting the going to the hospital for treatment. 
Um, and then the second piece is the vaccination, the vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Um, so 250 are hosp hospitalized, they reported yesterday, 187 are unvaccinated, and 63 are fully vaccinated. So those vaccines are still holding, um, ideally keeping, um, uh, preventing serious illness and death um, from COVID. You know, and my plea is, please talk to your medical provider and help make a decision that's best for you if you have not been vaccinated yet or up for a booster if you're eligible to do so. How are you, de how are you defining fully vaccinated? So fully vaccinated is defined as um, one dose is the, of the Johnson & Johnson or two doses of your mRNA vaccines. Okay. Does it include boosters? I'm sorry? It doesn't include doesn't boosters. include boosters, yeah. If we add in the booster language, we'll call it up to date. It's Speaking of vaccinations, <coughs> how are you seeing it with our kids? How's the, those numbers looking? Uh, give me a few more slides hey, and I will break it down. <laughs> <laughs> See how I'm predicting the future. <laughs> predicting the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so countywide, 57% um, of folks in Alamance County have been uh, vaccinated for our, our booster those, those that have got booster to show in 40,000. Um, have received their boosters or are eligible to do so. And I'll talk about in a sec how they just, uh, they, the CDC and the FDA just moved the numbers down for 12 to 17 year old, but 40,000, that's right around 23, 24% of our, our, our population number there. Just doing quick math. Looking at our ages by, by subgroups there. So five, I mean, I'm just gonna do the read from the right, right hand where it's defined as fully vaccinated. So the two shots of the mRNA vaccines, the one shot of the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, 5 to 11, 15 percent are uh, fully vaccinated. 12 to 17, 42 percent are fully vaccinated. That number has remained pretty much unchanged for the last couple months now. We haven't seen a lot of movement um, with that age group. 18 to 24, 52 percent. 25 to 49, 57 percent. 50 to 64, 72 percent. 65 to 74, 85 percent. And 75 and older, 91 percent population. All right, and so these are some of the changes that have occurred over the last couple of weeks that we've um, adjusted to at the, the health department and healthcare providers uh, out there. So boosters um, are now available for um, those 12 and older. Um, the Pfizer, the Pfizer is the uh, vaccine for uh, 12 and above. Um, for Moderna, um, 18 and above, and for Johnson and Johnson. Um, it's 18 and above for your mRNA vaccines. So your, your Pfizer and your Moderna, it's five months after you've completed your, your two shots, your series there. And for Johnson & Johnson, it's two months um, after you completed your, your first shot is the recommendation uh, to getting your booster. Talk about testing um, real you quick. Slow you down one minute. Are you seeing any adverse reactions to the, uh, to the booster? Um, I'm just going to speak anecdotally, being at the health department and observing that way, so I haven't seen anything or any, any uh, red flags come from the CDC or warnings, if you will, um, at the health department. Everything's been running smoothly. You know, I mean, knock on wood, we haven't uh, had anybody with any type of anaphylaxis conditions. Now, I will say, with the booster, just like when you get your, your primary, some people have an inflammatory response and may have a low-grade fever or may not feel so well or tired, whatever it may be, um, with the booster. Some do just fine. Said, um, I got my shot and so be it. So didn't, don't have any uh, reaction to it. I, just an anecdotal story, my son got his, not booster, but um, uh, meningococcal vaccine and he felt worse with that than he did with the, uh, the COVID-19 booster. So yeah, yeah. So it knocked him down for two days. But. Well, this morning you gave an interesting explanation on the differences between the vaccines. Could you repeat that for the board, please? Sure, absolutely. So um, when we're looking at the two vaccines, obviously we differentiate them from the mRNA vaccine. And of course, people say, well, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So just kind of a little bit about what the mRNA vaccine and what the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is. The mRNA vaccine, so your Moderna and your Pfizer, um, the way that works is it is a recipe, if you will, uh, that is wrapped in a ball of fat that uh, is obviously injected into your arm and that ball of fat serves as a carrier that helps go into the cell and your cell absorbs that and takes this recipe and says, okay, I've got a re recipe here. I'm gonna build this protein um, with the recipe and it builds the protein. And that protein just happens to be a piece of that spike of the, the coronavirus there. So it builds the protein, the body say, hey, this looks foreign to me. 
I don't like it. I'm going to get rid of it, and I'm going to remember how to get rid of it. And so that's how it kind of builds its memory and, and antibodies and attacks it and keeps preventing. So that's how the mRNA works. It's, it's a recipe. The body builds it and then gets rid of it and then destroys the recipe uh, so the body can't make any more of it. The Johnson & Johnson is what they call a, a vector type of vaccine. So it is basically a inert virus, the, the adenovirus, um, and that serves as the carrier with a piece of genetic material of that spike of the coronavirus. Um, that gets injected into you, goes into the cell. The body recognizes that foreign piece of genetic material and says, I don't like that. Um, we're going to get rid of you, and it learns how to fight off those virus, uh, the virus itself. Um, so it recognizes the spike protein and, and, and wants to rid of it. So that's kind of the way those two, in a simple sense, the way those two vaccines work. Didn't you, don't you use vector as jet talk? Yes. <laughs> thought so. Jet talk, okay. Yeah, thought so. What's your vector, Victor? Um, so testing, there's been a lot of demand for testing. <laughs> Cases up, a lot of demand for testing. We were just talking about it. Um, from just reading the news, the stores have been in short supply at the health department. We've been in short supply in our orders on, um, on test have been on back order. Testing vendors have seen lines. I really got to give a shout out and a, a thanks to the you know, sheriff's office, the city of Burlington, county manager. Um, we've had off-duty police officers because traffic and testing has backed up in our, in our environmental health stuff has backed up down the road and we want to get help get the cars off the road optum does the testing but they're overwhelmed um so it was a great community effort to help get these cars off the road so they can get tested in a safe environment so high demand um and it just wasn't to one area other other testing agencies out there were having very similar cha challenges with traffic and not enough tests um, I, th I think we're starting to get caught up now and orders are starting to get fulfilled. So we'll have the, the conversation with Sherry and, 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 and try to get those tests um, in, in ahead of it. I, I will say with the test, if someone's symptomatic and they do test negative, they should still at least stay out from work to make sure it's not the flu. It's not another virus that they can spread till it's ruled out by another a provider saying, okay, you don't have corona. Let your symptoms improve and then you can right. return to work. So that recommendation. Um, would be there with that. Um, if you need to find a testing spot for the for the public, they can go on NCDHS website. Just Google NCDHS, find my testing spot. It pops right up. As you can see, put in your address at wherever you're, you're at, um, and uh, it will give you a whole host of options to test. If you don't have access to a computer, NCDHS has a call number, which is 888-675-4567. Uh, to help out or call the Alamance County Coronavirus Hotline at 336-290-0361 and we're more than happy to help out and find a testing spot for folks. Is that on one of our, is that on our website? Mm -hmm. Just take it. It, it, it. It's right where I, I took it so. from. Yes. <laughs> I cut and paste from our website. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise I wouldn't be able to rattle it off. <laughs> All right, is that being published in the media too? Uh, it was. It was? Okay. For the past two weeks we've had stories on on the crown and the surge and the demand for testing. Good. So in other words, the pop-ups, we have like three or four very top banner. One of those, if I remember correctly, is the corona issue. Yes, on, on the website, that'll, yeah. that'll yeah, it gives you the option so to all go. All you gotta do is go to type in Google Alamance County Government and then click on it and just wait for that to pop up. Correct, yeah. It'll get you, there's the testing site icon uh, for testing, specifically for, right. for Optum, and then there, some will take you to the health department page, and you can look at the dashboard or call the appointment line if you want a uh, COVID appointment. Of course, vaccinate. Alamance is alive and well. If you want the vaccination, you can go on that and schedule an appointment with us, and then uh, it has the coronavirus hotline number on the website as well. I think I would encourage our employers in the county too to become familiar with that information mm -hmm. because they're de they're having to deal deal with the, the shortages of staff and if they can guide people that don't know where to go get the test sometimes people just think there's one or two locations guide people where to go get the test or provide that information in advance that will help them get their people allocated to what's going on and what's available to them i'd like to thank assistant county manager and head of it bruce walker because that banner flipping through what every five seconds or whatever it is, not long, 
can just click on it. And that's good job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Scott in the back who did that. <laughs> Scott nice. Ward did. He sped it up so that you could, we have so much on there where you can speak through and just click on it. So it was his idea. So Scott Ward did that. Awesome. Good job. Yep. Um, there have been changes to the quarantine and isolation um, for, for folks, so the isolation. So again, isolation is if you have COVID, you have symptoms, um, is when you're in isolation. Isolation period is uh, five days. So if you're asymptomatic and don't have symptoms, obviously you're going to find out because the test probably told you you have COVID. Um, your day zero starts from the time you took that test. If you have symptoms, day zero starts from your symptoms first started. Um, and then you want to go 24 hours without a fever, and of course you want to have some type of improvement of your symptoms. So five days in isolation, the remaining five days, you should wear a mask, run around people, wherever you're at to help prevent the spread. You still could possibly uh, have enough viral load to be able to spread it, so that mask is that extra protective layer. If you were there. symptomatic for 10 days, you would still want to stay in isolation, right? Ideally, if you're not improve, if your symptoms are not improving, you still want to stay in isolation. Right. Correct. Yeah, that means you still probably have a exactly. high enough viral load that that's easy to transmit. How long should you stay in isolation after the last symptoms? A after your symptoms start to go down, so yeah. yeah. So ten days is usually the sta the standard. That's why I mentioned a little bit ago. If you're moderate to severe you're going to be in isolation a little little bit longer, um, even up to 20 days, because um, and, and most of the time these are folks that are probably in the hospital um, and they're, they're having some type of complication, but they have a high viral load that the body's still fighting. Um, so, but for, for the most, for, in general, uh, mild cases, that five days, wear a mask for the remaining five days will, will suffice. Are we still given monoclonal antibodies at, at um, most? So, are, so um, that that's one of the challenges. Um, so, with with my understanding, um, Omicron only one of the monoclonal clonal, and I don't know which one um, is it seems to work. Um, and there has been a shortage of the monoclonal antibodies as well. So it's kind of on a tier system. So our our folks that are 65 and older or have uh, chronic medical conditions are really being prioritized for that piece. Same thing, they have the antivirals now that have just been approved um, by, the, by the FDA and CDC in the last couple um, um, weeks. And um, those are the supply chain issue, right? We gotta, we get, just like the vaccines, they gotta build up, they gotta be produced and they gotta get out there. So they're kind of working their way through, but there's a tier system there for the mo those the most. And we have to get those on board early within the first couple days um, of symptoms onset. We don't wanna drag it out any longer. What does that do? It works. That's it all I can work. say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know, but I mean, what does it do? It, it just, you basically just, they give you an IV, and it's two. It's, mm -hmm. well, mine was two. They put it in the IV, and they just give you an IV. It took me, it took 39 minutes to run its course, and then they had to observe. And 39. of course, and then I asked them, um, well, I was having one uh -huh, watch. Yeah, um, <laughs> Because they said 45, <laughs> and, but it give you 30 minutes to, to, to observe you. Well, my question to the nurses, what are you observing for? And they said, well, uh, we want to make sure that you don't have uh, blotches in your skin, like your skin doesn't start to blotch. Uh, and if that happens, we have something that we can do for them. That's the major side effect. Now, I was in there, uh, the day I was in there, I was in there for two hours, must have went through 25 different people, you know, different stages. No one had any adverse conditions during the two hours I was there. Yeah. But it's very interesting. It's very interesting. And I was sick for, uh, they told me to go home and uh, be prepared to have a fever. Well, I got home at 1030 that morning, and at 1 o'clock I started having a headache, took my fever, but by 4 o'clock it was all gone. And I believe you went running. Yeah, I went running. Because uh, I couldn't go out 10 days, so I went out. I. Tony, under, I told you this might work. <laughs> I set my alarm for like 4 5 o'clock in the morning. I ran all through downtown Burlington because I, I think the only person I had to run away from was the janitor. And he asked me, well, what, are you, what are you doing so close to my building? <laughs> but yeah, it was fun. I'm just, I'm just curious because I hear about that yeah. all the time. I think, what is it that it does for it, a person it, it, with It helps infant? the body build immune response to be able to fight that it's virus like just bolsters yeah like spinach yeah. Yeah. and i just i just had uh tony knows this i got tested uh i got covid tested positive on september 9th 
and I 19th he tells me three months December 19th I went and had my antibodies checked I was 40 points higher than the nearest vaccine so I just need to basically hang out with you well get COVID and you'll, you'll yeah, be fine still, I, have the back, I have the virus about a year and a half ago now and I'm still carrying the, the antibodies this is like a confessional <laughs> it's just totally fascinating me I mean getting it and you know I've had relatives and friends have gotten and I've had a couple of friends who died who had nothing wrong with them yeah. got COVID and died no. so <laughs> definitely and you know being on the health board with Tony it's definitely opened my eyes to a lot of things um, now that antibody does it have a like, fat ball too that you was talking about <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I I'm, heard. I'm not quite, completely that sure what great, that's made up I of. need you in the medical journal <laughs> yeah. now the question is do you need any donors Right. Gotcha. So I'm not I'm not completely certainly how those are made. I be, I believe they're artificially made. I'm not 100 percent on how they do that. So I'd have to I'd have to look that one up. Right. Guy in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> you note that I have not had summer yet. I'm staying quiet. <laughs> Uh, so there's been changes to the, the, the quarantine isolation and the quarantine as well. Um, quarantine, stay at home for five days. And again, this is for general population and, and uh, monitor for symptoms after day five, come out of quarantine, wear a mask, and if you have the ability to get tested just to rule it out to make sure something hasn't developed uh, from the quarantine piece. Uh, there have been changes to the NCDHS K-12 through uh, toolkit. So isolation, um, again, when you have COVID, a uh, period of five days, continue to wear a mask for five additional days. The asymptomatic day zero starts when you take your test, and then with symptoms, day zero starts when your symptoms start, no fever, symptoms begin to approve. As far, as far as exposures or quarantine, so school exclusion, period of five days. Um, so five days after expo exposure, must continue to wear a mask after five additional days and if possibly tested on day five. A second piece to this, that change, is test to stay. I think um, I mentioned early on back in November that there are some studies going around. Studies that happen in other states, studies that happened here in North Carolina with, by the uh, ABC Collaborative. So this was an update to the guidance. For those schools that um, have universal masking in place, um, the test to stay option is, is there and it's not applied to household exposures. And what a household exposure is, that exposure that occurs from mom to dad to brother to sister, I mean, there's a lot of exposures that occur there, right? And so that's not, that's not why that's on there. So you would default to the five days, five days mask there. But these are exposures that happen in school. Should the exposure happen in school, of course they wouldn't need to, um, uh, quarantine out of school then um, and the recommendation be get tested on the day that the exposure notice occurred and then on day five uh, be tested and of course wear the mask in the school settings and then previously just like um, was before which I didn't change but I'll just mention them if, if kids are up to date and their vaccines they wouldn't have to quarantine if they've had uh, COVID in the last 90 days they wouldn't have to quarantine and if both individuals were properly wearing a mask they would not have to quarantine and then the last piece um, I'll talk about is uh, mass distribution. So social services and health. We received notice from the state uh, last week, I believe it was, that we both were getting a total of 34,095 masks and they would like to, uh, they, the state would like us to distribute it out, get, get those masks out and to the public, so public distribution. So um, Adrian and I put our heads together and our leadership teams and we have tasked a uh, young man by uh, Maliki, I think he's, he's joined me in uh, the meetings here before. He's our uh, Elon fellow, so he's, he's leveraging other Elon fellows, his fraternity, um, the volunteer folks at Elon, and they are currently developing a plan to get all 34,000 masks out into the community, so your churches and Dream Center and uh, shelters or wherever it may be, um, so uh, folks will have access to these N95, um, hot, very high filtered type of uh, masks. So hopefully that will start ideally at the end of this week, if not going in the next week, and we'll start getting those masks out there. Is the school system providing that particular type of mask for their teachers since they're back in the classroom? Is they Are they under that 34,000 or does the school have their own? I do not know on the school system. I'd okay. have to, to find out. Okay. Yeah. But this 34,000 was really specific to what our marching orders from the state was to get those out into the public. Is there a protocol on 
who gets them or just get it, get them get them out to the public um and that's what we're gonna do we'll, we'll come up with a corner plan i'm thinking right? yeah <laughs> churches and, and you obviously want to protect our, our population especially in congregate living facilities so any type of our shelter so on and so forth yeah where people are congregate so yeah n95 mask is only it's not good indefinitely right so typically you see, you'll see us wear them in the healthcare setting to right. protect us. They, they have a high filtration, I believe 95% protection rate. And uh, usually we have to do a mask fitting in the occupational setting, but in the volunteer setting where we're handing this out and it's not used for occupation, um, they can still, still be effective. And, and uh, I think that's the idea to give people the opportunity to wear it, especially with the omnicron chronic variant being as infectious is to have these masks and hopefully knock down some of the, uh, the uh, variant from spreading. I think his question was, what is the service life of a typical in 95 mask? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you in the occupational setting, typically, if we were had an infectious patient, we change them out every time. Um, we have guidance from the state in the occupational health care setting. As long as we're not treating COVID patients, once a day we, we're changing it. But that's in the occupational setting. In the general public, I do not know the answer. To that as far as how long they'll last before they start degrading. Okay. So we're getting uh, 68,000 total? Thir 34,000 total. So we're total. getting 16,000 and some change and social services getting okay. 16,000 and some change. And we're for about one-sixth of the population of Alamance County. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> the state tried, John. <laughs> <laughs> One day for one sixth of the population of Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all. I'm happy to answer any questions. Now, they do have those available. And, uh, I mean, even the Walmart, I think the ones I've got at home actually got from my shop and uh, a long time ago. Well, they've been around for a while. But you can buy them in, in retailers. Yeah, so they're sort of different. There's the K95 and then there's the N95, um, so they have different lays and different gradients and how effective they, they are. My daughter teaches third grade. She's got the cutest kids and like hypothetically, two boys come in one day, one had a Batman, one had a Superman, and then went home, they had the other mask. <laughs> they had flipped and said, I like that, okay, and they just flipped them. What are you gonna do? They're third graders, eight, eight years old. They're the bomb, I'm gonna tell you. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Okay, Ms. Rollins. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Buckle up, right? <laughs> so, the American Rescue Plan was enacted in March of 21. And in May, the uh, U.S. Treasury released interim guidance. And now it's January, and we have the final guidance. So it took about nine months for us to get here. But uh, they released final guidance January 6th. We've had a little bit less than two weeks to um, review it and are getting summaries from, from various experts and would like to share some updates with you today. Um, I didn't put together a, a written document of these updates because I think we're gonna hear more and more over the next week uh, details that might be of more interest to Alamance County than some others. So I didn't wanna give you this generic update, um, but right now I can do, um, I can summarize at a high level. And if you do have questions or things that you want researched, we'll bring that back to you after we have um, dug into the documentation. The uh, final guidance, well, the law is a little over 600 pages. The law has not changed. It has not changed from the beginning, but the U.S. Treasury has issued two, the interim guidance and then final guidance. The final guidance is over 400 pages long. They also gave us a, uh, an overview of their final guidance. I've given you all a hard copy. This is a 44-page document that we, we highlighted in um, Yellow highlights what is new. So what I told you from the interim guidance is still true. And then they have added new things that we've highlighted in yellow. I've given you a hard copy. And then we'll, um, we've got a website link where you can look up all kinds of information and the public can look up whatever they might be interested in as well. 
So um, having said that, I do want to remind you of a couple of things in advance. So this is the overview of what ARP is intended to do, and it's important because they have refined how they talk about it. Um, they want the money to be spent to fight the pandemic and support families and businesses struggling with its public health and economic impact. They want to, us to maintain vital public services, even amid declines in revenue. And they want us to build a strong, resilient, and equitable recovery by making investments that support long-term growth and opportunity. So this is kind of the guidance that we're getting at the federal level. And the um, final rule is, is designed to, to lead us in that direction. Um, Alamance County received over $32 million. Our first tranche was received last May. Our second should be coming this May. So we should have the, the cash in our hands uh, fairly shortly. And uh, right now our available balance, when I say available, this is what's not yet budgeted for specific purpose, is $26.3 million. If you'll recall, we had uh, $3.8 million that we applied to salaries and, and uh, benefits for March and June of 21. We're calling that our pandemic response too because we are basically supplanted local funds. Those funds are available for future use and they do not have any future spending restrictions other than what our local funds might have. Uh, there's a million, over a million dollars that was budgeted in August for new positions, equipment, and some support for nonprofit agencies. And then we had a 1.7 million HVAC project that was uh, budgeted in September. So that's how we uh, have a remaining 26.3 million that uh, may be budgeted in future for whatever projects. So the dates have not changed. March 3rd of 21 is the first date we can spend money. December 31st of 24 is the target date to finish spending money unless we have something that is a project where we have committed funds and we have two more years after that to complete that project. These are the five spending categories that the um, interim rule and the final rule talk about. They haven't changed their categories. The law hasn't changed, but they have added a little more flexibility that I'd like to talk about. You can get to my notes. Here they are. So the first thing that I'm going to do them out of order, but if you look at the center of this slide, replacing lost revenue was where the federal government said if you, your agency had lost revenue growth due to the pandemic, they, they gave us a funding formula to compute what that number might be, and then they give the rules for spending that dollar amount of your funding, of your ARP funding, were fairly liberal. They said that you can spend in this category on anything that you normally do as a government. So the um, final rule expanded that a little bit further. They haven't changed the rules on how to spend, but what they have said is, in addition to the funding formula, you may also choose a standard dollar amount up to $10 million. So if you uh, did not have revenue loss, you could choose to set aside up to $10 million of your allocation in this category to spend on general government services. It's an either or. If you choose to do the $10 million allocation, you tell them and that is a one-time decision and you can't change your mind a year later and go back and say, well, we've really lost revenue elsewhere and we want to use that methodology. It's a, a choice that you would make one time and stick with it. For Alamance County, the funding formula does not compute anything as revenue loss. Um, we don't expect that to change. So right. under the funding formula, we can't spend in this category unless we choose the standard amount. Now is that for both, does that allow you to spend it for both operating expenses and for capital expenditures? So that's the other big change that has happened in all of these categories. I thought I saw that today, yeah. If an expenditure is eligible for programmatic reasons, for operating reasons, it can also be eligible for the capital. You may also spend in, the, in whatever category, using the rules in that category, you can spend on operations or the capital support that operation. 
and revenue replacement, all gov most government activities are going to be eligible. They have a few um, things that, that are hurdles that we would have to, to worry about, but generally anything that we do as local government that we're allowed to do by the state of North Carolina, in that category we would be able to spend up to $10 million should you choose to elect that standard amount. And that's important because we found out today at, um, so the School of Government has been doing trainings last week. This week, NACO did their first training and uh, the National Agency is trying to find out is the deadline for making the election for the standard deduction on January 31st. Our first, or not our first, but our next reporting deadline is January 31st and we may need to make that election to choose to use the standard amount on that date. We're not sure, but if we um, needed to make that decision, we need to be prepared to make that decision just in case that is a firm deadline. And we want to have a board meeting, is that this year? This year. So do we need to address that tonight? If the commissioners didn't want to address that this evening, we do not know if that's going to be a requirement yet. I think uh, Andrea, uh, they're monitoring <coughs> that to see if it's going to be a requirement that we make that firm commitment. If, if you don't do that this evening, and you, we would probably look at having a special meeting to bring the board right. back to vote, to because we, we don't spend these funds or allocate these funds unless you vote to do that. So uh, right now what you're hearing is even though we didn't lose revenue, we have this ability to allocate $10 million of the ARP funding uh, to be used with very little restrictions, which is good news. You could use it for capital. You could use it for programs. You do most anything you want to do with it. But if we have to make that call by January 31st, we either need to do that tonight and say, yes, what we want to do, or uh, we'll, we'll let you know. We will monitor uh, the progress from Treasury. And if we see we're getting close to that 24 hours, excuse me, I think it's 48 hours we have to have, Tori, for the special meeting notice, we would have to call you and get back together and have a special meeting just to, if you wanted to do that. I mean, I would tell you that the advantage would be to the county to allocate funds this way because it does take to up to $10 million of these ARC funds and put them in a place where you could use them for lots of different sure. uh, purposes. And in fact, if you have capital projects that may not fit, which I think we, we don't have many capital projects that do not fit under these other buckets, would you say, Andrea? Not many, but there, there are certain categories of things that may not fit in the other and the other categories of spending that would fit under general services. Do you have to allocate a total of 10 or can you allocate 8, 9, 7? <clears throat> it's a standard. For our agency, since we received more than 10 million, the expectation is that we would choose that methodology and we would get exactly 10 million in this category. For agencies that received less than $10 million, they can allocate up to their full amount that they received. Oh, okay. And it's actually, there are um, two decisions to be made. The decision to choose this methodology is separate, that you're not determining how you're going to spend the funds. You're basically saying, we're going to use this methodology. We want the $10 million available to us. So the, the second, remaining $26 million then would be allocated among the other four categories? would be available in the other right. four categories. And then you can determine later how you want to spend your $10 million. That decision, as far as we know, does not have to be made by January 31st. The how to spend. How to spend, does you, I don't think we have to make that, that determination or report that plan on January 31st. Right. And we can't tell you tonight that we must decide tonight to allocate the $10 million. We think it's possible that we're going to be required to, on January 31st, report whether or not we want to allocate that way. If we don't do that tonight, that's fine, but we would we would not let the decision get beyond the 48-hour notice that would be required for a special meeting, and we'd have to ask the board, if you want to do this, uh, we would need to get back together special meeting uh, notice given and then vote to allocate the 10 million this way. And again, this January 31st of this year. 13 yes. days. Yes. Yeah. 13 days. Yeah. That ain't too far off. Yeah, I'll be here before you know it. And Andrew, as I read the guidance on page six, recipients may determine their revenue loss by choosing between two options, a standard allowance of up to $10 million in aggregate, not to exceed their standard, their award amount. So I wonder if that allows for some figure less than. 
I think it probably does. You're making the determination that you're going to spend up to $10 million in this category. But if you choose to allocate, if you choose projects that you don't need to use this category, it, the money can be moved to the other categories. It could be expended in the other categories. So in the end, how you actually expend the funds might be less than $10 million. So it's just making a decision that we might spend up to $10 million in that category, not that we will and that we're locked into it. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at Andrew. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about that last sentence. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. So what will happen when the decision is made and the report is submitted? They ask, are you, they ask you to check the, bo the box, yes or no, this is an irrevocable decision. Are you planning to use the formula? Yes or no. If you choose to not use the formula, the assumption would be that we put $10 million of the funds in this category. At some point, we will be reporting how we spent that $10 million. So there's a quarterly report that goes in, and the, the fact that it is intended or allocated in that category does not mean that it can't be moved. And Andrea, is it correct to say that if the commissioners choose to allocate $10 million in this lost revenue category, they would be able to spend that $10 million on, uh, if they wanted to, on programs or capital that fall into the other buckets? Yes. So okay. if you, that, if you, that's kind of what I was alluding to. Yes, yeah, so if, you, if you earmark this $10 million, category, we you've taken away a, a great deal of the uh, um, requirements. and. It's the administrative burden. So we yes. could use some of that, for example, for some of the needs we had presented in our public hearing. Yes. So it, it the, the, these other yeah, under the new China. guidance right. uh, programs and capital that fall under these other buckets, you could use funding for right. capital or programs. But if you do this ten million dollar dedication, you could right. use it right. for those same projects. If you had a project that you needed to augment, it needed more money, right? If you didn't have enough in one of those categories, you could take it from this ten million. This ready. ten million could be used for even non. COVID related uh, spending. You can use it for anything that you can lawfully spend money Yes, if you wanted to, I mean, <laughs> within wow. the realm of what local government can do legally, yeah. right? You know, there's some things we can and cannot do, but that's uh, that would be the. Is this in addition to that 26 or whatever? No. 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 It's not additional funding, but within the funding that we received. So your 3.8 million is kind of in a bucket like that now, yeah, right? right? It's, it's, exactly. in a, it's in a fund that. We track, we're watching, if you want to apply it toward any type ARP related project or capital project or program, you can do that. But the 3.8 is not part of that 10 million. That is correct. No. It, it, that left you with 26 million. If you took 10 million and put it in this replace lost revenue column, you would have uh, 16, 16 million, million left to spread among the other ARP um, categories. And you could even take some of this 10 million and put it in an ARP category on a project if that's what you needed to do. Hmm. I mean, I, I, I move that we yeah. take standard $10 million deduction and uh, make that our designated use of that money. I'll second that. Yep. Well, I think that is the right choice to I make, Commissioners, yeah. in, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. And if you, if you do that this evening, then I believe that is how we would report that for the January 31st. Uh, and then we're not having to worry about trying to get a special meeting in here or, you know, if they require it or whatever. The only thing that might happen between now if you vote to do this tonight, in January 31st, could be if they, if between now and January 31st, they told us they wanted to know specifically what it would be spent on. But I think that's a much less likely to happen. Um, yeah, I agree. I, is that correct? Okay. They gave us a pretty short window. I would think yeah. they yeah. would ask us that yeah. at that point. Yeah. 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 But if they did, we could call a meeting. Yes. Yes. But yeah. Have that a motion. Would be a worse day. <laughs> have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? That $10 million. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking. Um, you can't use it as part of the 26 if you decide to not use it as what you're putting it aside for 10. It's kind of, it can go back and forth, but it's safe in that column. If you, if you put it, if, if you vote this evening to put 10 million, of your, you got 26 million left, if you take 10 million of it and put it in this, this allocation, mm -hmm. it's still part of your 26 million you can use it on any ARP related project, either program or capital, but it does free it from the restrictions, right? So you could even do things uh, that ARP money may not pay for. I think an example could be the court building, for example. 
I or diversion center? Yes, the diversion center, I think what you may hear is that uh, the diversion center may actually fall under one of these right. categories that you don't have to worry about trying to beat a restriction. But the, uh, the court building, for example, if, if you wanted to use ARP dollars to help augment, you know, we have currently 14 or $15 million in our capacity to pay for the court building. If you want to take the court budget to a higher level using ARP, you're probably going to have to use this $10 million because it's not going to, I don't think, right. fit well in any of these other columns. Am I saying that correct, Andrew? Correct. So it still remains part of your $26 million. You can use it to pay for programs or capital that you've been presented. It's just it has less restrictions, and if you wanted to do something like court capital using ARP, this would be the dollars you could target. You could also target your three point eight million. That's uh, that's no longer part of the. It's outside the twenty six. Uh, uh, does that make sense? Uh, does that answer your question, Commissioner? Yeah. It does. No. I'm just gonna let. No, I don't know. All this money, and a couple of projects I'm thinking of can just take the whole thing. That's right. So. Didn't we say we identified about $48 million in need? So. I think uh, $48 million total, that was that was actually before the public hearing. I think there was some right. additional that came in through the public hearing. Uh, and that's, that's just what you know, mm -hmm. what your people told you. That's for the question. So, wow. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. So I have a few more items that I'd like to share with you, um, but that was the uh, the biggest change that they made was in that revenue replacement category. The second biggest was to be clear that capital is allowed. So um, they've given some guidance. They are uh, there's a whole separate section on capital in the the executive summary that you received, simply because they want us to substantiate. So they're going to want uh, more documentation for how we're how we're handling capital, why it's a priority, uh, why the way we're doing capital is a priority over doing it differently. So for example, if we chose uh, um, to spend on a diversion center building, why we would choose to go one route versus another, we would need to document and provide that information. But other than the, the documentation levels, the capital seems to be, um, seems to be in every category. So, and since I did mention the Diversion Center, that falls under public health, which is the very first category. Substance abuse, opioid um, e efforts, uh, behavioral health, all of the continuum of care for mental health and substance abuse falls under that public health category. And um, you could spend all of the funds there, whether it's the 10 million or any other pieces of your um, your ARP funding and uh, do, uh, do both operations as well as capital. Same thing for the uh, economic impact area. Uh, what they have changed there, originally they were focusing on the, the qualified census tract, people who live there, businesses that, that were located there. They've expanded the definition of what they consider um, to be uh, those who were uh, negatively impacted by the, uh, the pandemic, they've expanded that. They're hanging on to the concept of low income, but they've expanded their definition outside of QCT to also include those who qualify for federal services because of their income, people who um, uh, get free lunch in school, you know, families that qualify for a host of, of DSS level services, um, communities, and, and uh, neighborhoods that would qualify under these kind of programs would also um, be much more likely to be automatically eligible under the negative economic impact now. Um, we can always spend the effort to quantify uh, certain regions or, or populations if we thought that they were not automatically included but having them automatically included, once again, reduces the administrative burden on making a decision and, and supporting that decision. So we're talking about specific neighborhoods within the county as opposed to a general population within the county? Yes, we had that, uh, Commissioner recall, we had that map of that qualified census tract that was uh, primarily northeast, uh, Burlington, northeast right. central Burlington, mm -hmm. that was under interim guidance uh the rules define that as a place to spend funding for programs or capital that was 
very, very easy to spend money there, right, under these rules. I think what we're hearing now is that it's possible to expand that area. Um, th there's benefit in doing that if the commissioners choose to spend money uh, doing either programs or capital investment in, in uh, communities that are, that are similar to the QCT because it does reduce our, um, uh, our reporting requirements and our, the effort we have to put into justifying that to the, to the feds. So. They've been very specific with the guidance, so if there is an interest, a project, we would go straight back to the, to the guidance to find out if what we're considering is going to fall under their rules or if we're going to have to do additional work. Well, shouldn't we be then having some conversations with our municipal neighbors about, I mean, they received buckets of money as well, so if we want to look at trying to help some areas such as Northeast Burlington, Shouldn't we be looking at dealing with Burlington and sharing funds with them, them, put them contributing some toward this pro a, a project if we were to come up with one as well? I don't want to. I don't want to jump too far ahead of uh, Andrea because she's the expert on on reviewing this. Her and her team. Uh, I will say that I think now that we know that we've got a lot more freedom capital wise and programmatically, it's uh, it will probably be valuable to very soon for the commissioners to revisit those those potential ideas of how to spend this money and start making some decisions because if the commissioners prioritize other projects above uh, QCT spending, then we may not be engaging our municipal partners. But if the commissioners say QCT spending in, in that area of the county and the city is important, absolutely. We need to be sitting down with Burles and saying, okay, how do, we, how do we work together with whatever dollars the commissioners allocate for that to say, if we we're gonna put, the board has said they're interested in putting X number of dollars into this. How much are you putting into this? Are you putting any? How can you help us leverage uh, our funds? You know? I guess I'm just thinking that they're having the same conversations we are. It might be prudent <clears throat> to give them a heads up that we might be thinking about something like that so that they don't jump out, commit funds, and then coming back and say, well, we've already committed funds to a different area. And uh, if, we, if it's something we would, would normally want a partnership with, it might be. The only thing I'd say to the commissioners, um, and again, I feel like I'm jumping ahead of this, but. Uh, it will be helpful for staff at some point relatively soon for commissioners to, to light on what you want to do with these funds because we're going to, some of these are capital and will take significant work to just get the project up and running. Right. And other And it'll also take a lot of work from, from county staff to start laying the groundwork for making sure we're meeting criteria. So if you, at some point, we'll really need to hear from the board these are the roads we want you to go down or else all our staff will be going down all these roads right and some of them may, it may not be necessary if you're not interested in some of the things or not interested i wouldn't say but if you prioritize some of the potential projects you've heard higher than others with our limited resources we want to focus on those right i'm not don't want to leave anything out but we want to be sure right. we're, we're really focusing on what the board is interested in or prioritizes higher so one other area that I would mention, I'd mentioned that public sector capacity is an area that um, the ARP funds can be spent on. They have expanded what they talk about when they're talking about premium pay and when they're talking about paying for emergency services. They've expanded um, what they consider automatically eligible. So for example, emergency services would be you know, detention workers or EMS or DSS now, which originally they didn't include DSS, um, but health department. So there are uh, our emergency service groups. Um, they have expanded ARP to do uh, to be available for things like uh, taking them back to pre-pandemic salaries, increasing them so that you can retain them. Uh, any kind of tools that that the kind of things that we've been talking about. Um, in, in these meetings anyway, ARP may now be used for that purpose and they have defined how the money can be spent. So they have very specific rules about how much can be spent in categories, but they're also loosening up um, who might be eligible and um, basically if you're bolstering government and spending money on compensation to do that, um, that kind of support uh, is, is now allowed and encouraged. That's also a way to supplant. So if we are doing things for our folks, 
using local dollars and wanted to use ARP funding um, for something that ARP is not, it's not easy. We could supplant our local salaries and stick that money to the side, just like the 3.8 million for purposes that the commissioners want. So it's important for us, uh, the staff, to maintain a knowledge of, of what these rules are to see if that's possible. Water and sewer and broadband. So they've expanded water and sewer past just the state revolving fund <coughs> categories and they've included things like dams and uh, infrastructure, wells, septic, um, things that uh, were originally not really mentioned, lead remediation activities, replacing lead pipes all over the place. Um, they also have broadened their broadband. Um, originally they were saying you must bring it to certain levels, certain speeds, and it can only be for those who don't have it already. And they've now said, well, that's the optimum, but if you wanted to do something um, and you, you have a recommendation, you're going to be allowed to, to consider it. So broadband, uh, and I'm a little fuzzy there because the training is next week, but the, uh, the broadband is very specific on what the rules are, and then they've now um, said that those were all targets and recommendations, but that they're going to loosen the actual requirements. But don't we still have a state statute that says we can't do that unless we provide a utility? So part of what their um, ARP is, is kind of aligning, or the U.S. Treasury is aligning itself with uh, existing programs so the state programs are going to probably take the lead on uh, anything that we are allowed to do but the ARP funding is trying to the the US Treasury guidance seems to be stepping out of the way they're not going to dictate they're going to provide funding support for whatever your local initiatives are at the state level So the state budgeted what was it seven hundred million dollars for uh, broadband expansion in the state if they allocate that to the counties and then but they, they've still got a statute they're going to have to change in order for us to be able to spend it right Please i can those. speak a little to that um i sat in on a, a meeting last week and there's ongoing meetings school interpretations some of the things that seems clearer is that they put a lot more money into the state program uh you know the great grant program there's some question about if you can use art funding to do the match or not um, they've set simplified the standards and that before we were stuck with certain maps you know census track maps may show one section a bunch of people in the top right hand corner and then everybody else says no but it because it's applied across the whole track you can't spend money or you get a lower score they're making that easier they're making it easier to defend a an area that you might look at um, they're also setting a standard of wire line and, and actually increasing the stand wire line rather than wireless when it comes to what does that mean instead of like people using cellular for Wi-Fi right. connection for internet because that's less reliable than okay. wire line they're, they're putting more emphasis on wire line like fiber in the ground fiber optic right um, to folks and then setting the standard higher than just 25 megs down and three up, more of 100 down, and possibly there's some discussion because I think somebody wrote it that didn't understand the technology. Um, 100 down and 100 up is what they wrote, but some of the local stuff is 100 down and maybe 20 up and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So they're making, and then again, there is some state laws that they have to kind of iron out when it comes to that. Um, and there's more funding, and there's a couple other programs where the state maybe doing uh, creating an RFP to kind of do some joint uh, conversations with folks and you identify an area um, we were Craig and I were talking about that before and so they're heading toward that where they set a template uh, for an RFP or something like that so every week there's another meeting to talk about that and again some of the legalities when it comes to the state um, laws that either have to be changed or have to be interpreted just to make sure we leverage those funds coming through too so the broadband part is easier it's more be better to find what you can spend it on there are going to be more opportunities and there's more state money beyond the, the, the 32 million that you have here that the state's going to throw at it too they've made it a higher priority as well because that hopefully that to be continued with an asterisk but 
So I, I'm, I'm presuming that would probably have to be in some sort of public-private partnership. I mean, we don't do fiber. Right. No, it would have to be a partnership. But that's why if they design the RFP that pre-qualifies for some of this funding, that would be really helpful to the state creating that so that we can actually say, okay, we're, we identified these areas, you know, let's, let's put an RFP who could service this areas and then come back with the price and that would leverage some of the state funds and uh, you now there would be some uh, negotiation on uh, how much each would pay a private company and a local, you know, but that would be a decision you guys would make once you got the RFP. So the concept is that the final guidance has made that possible if the state of North Carolina will also agree, make sure that the um, the state has has we're following their their lead on this. So the ARP guidance included some very specific examples in the public health and negative economic impact categories, and these examples are they give um, they give assurance to things that we thought were were going to be possible. So. They have, at the federal level, said assistance can be provided to, to households. Assistance can be provided to small businesses. Assistance can be provided to nonprofits, veteran services. You can aid impacted industries like travel or tourism. We still have to follow the state of North Carolina rules, but the federal government has given in their guidance very specific examples of if you want to do this, here's how. Um, they have, have defined what assistance would be allowable, what would be considered appropriate. And assistance... So the small business loan program we did on the last fund, original COVID funding. Right. So they define small businesses that were impacted as defining... Uh, small businesses are, have no more than 500 employees, and then they would have to show that they were financially impacted by the pandemic. So we would be required, if spending money in those categories, <clears throat> to gather documentation from these these agencies to prove that that we have checked those those boxes and that we have um, provided assistance that has made a difference so in all of those categories there's uh, real guidance there that if there is an interest in specific programs we would research and and give you it's it reminds me of American Ninja Warrior or the, <laughs> the uh, yeah, the Wipeout TV show. You know, you've got a duck. You got to take a, a step to the left and, and and pay attention, all the all the time knowing where you're headed. So once we know those priorities, we can determine which funding source and how what we have to do to be in compliance with their um, their requirements to make that happen. For example, in that program, we were not allowed to grant monies to an individual corporations or, or businesses can't give it away but you can lend it and that's state law right so or will say things that um, you are allowed to do that state law might not allow right. oh. so next steps um, we are revisiting all of the proposals that were presented to the commissioners uh, there are some things that were not presented we did not think would be eligible and we want to make sure that um, if they were requested and they are uh, eligible under final guidance that you know about them. So for example, ambulances. Uh, we didn't uh, request new ambulances under the interim guidance uh, because we didn't didn't see that it was clearly likely to be to be allowable and it's it's now clear that it's eligible under federal guidance. Um, something like that, the Viper Towers. That was on the original list, but these were things that we weren't really sure were going to work out under interim guidance. Under final guidance, they um, these are examples of things that they have said would very likely be eligible. So we'll update that list and get that to you. And then, um, have as we looked at how far out? And this will be a Bruce question. I'm thinking, if you set up a Viper Tower, if we set up a couple of extra, uh, not extras, but Viper Towers to cover areas that are we're already having problems with communication. How far out? Will the uh, capability of if we if we partnered with Verizon or a whoever's going to put out a signal that could be picked up for broadband use, how far out could that signal go from a individual tower? It really depends on how, how high the tower is, the topography. Um, you know, if you're either 5G or the next incarnation, that kind of thing, or if they repurpose 4G. You know, 5G actually in some ways has to have more nodes. 
than uh, 4G, um, meaning reaching out further, but obviously it's much faster. So you're seeing smaller, you know, towers going out. So there's a lot, there's a lot to it. But I mean, needless to say, you would have coverage if you had Viper and you created um, space on that to rent out um, in those areas that are in need. But again, those folks would be wireless, not wired. And so they would have to get a MiFi or some kind of you know device in their house to do that. But you can get more coverage that way because otherwise you've got to run fiber optic down every road. Right. Dep it depends. We've had some conversations with some providers on this. A rough rule of thumb is five mile radius from a tower. Wait, pardon? Five mile radius from a tower for no rough. transmitting. It's rough. Right. For transmitting, so about seventy five, about a seventy five square mile area from one tower. I think the areas that we've identified as good potential sites for Viper towers. One was uh, down the uh, Snow Camp area, backside of Kane Mountain. By now, Kane Mountain kind of blocks some of the, the Viper transmissions. Then, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, northeast Alamance up in the Pleasant Grove area. Uh, coverage up there, according to the maps, was a little uh, was a little weak. So those are from just a coverage for Viper radio uh, transmissions. Those were the two areas that come to and mind. And those are areas that also have historically right. been underserved with high speed fire. Exactly. So you know it. Again, these are all these different things, and again, there's lots of new buckets, and there's additional funding for wireline, not that 32 million, but again, we talked about 700 million. There's going to be a certain amount allocated in each county. I heard that if people don't take advantage of it within two years, other counties can apply for that money later on if they don't take advantage of it and that kind of thing. So there's all sorts of things coming down the pike, and people are all over it right now. So um, more information to come. So the only thing I would leave you with is that uh, when we update this prior to this list of, of art projects, the requests that have been submitted at a couple of different meetings, we'll make sure that that information gets to you. Um, we are ready when prioritized projects are chosen. We are ready for staff to focus to determine what it takes to accomplish. Uh, there, there are hoops, there are things we're going to have to have to worry about and we also need attorney review so we want to make sure that we go through a thoughtful process to document determine the process and have a legal review right. of this plan uh, as as we go forward so uh, we're looking for next steps is uh, to determine is it what projects are worth investigating to that level mr chairman i have a question and a comment uh, Ms. Rollins, what does the new guidance say about lowering taxes and using money that you've kicked over into a supplant uh, fund or the $10 million to cover a reduction in taxes? So the law, I, th I think you've probably read it and you know the answer already, but um, you, you can't just cut your taxes. Uh, that's not an eligible use. We have to spend the ARP funds on something that uh, we purchase. And uh, we can't just pocket the money and put it in a rainy day fund. We're not allowed to use it for various sources like debt or we can't fund our pension. Um, and cutting taxes is a separate decision from spending ARP. So if we use the ARP funds for, for identified <coughs> needs and then we get the budget time and we find out we have projected revenues sufficient to reduce the taxes, then we could do that without it because it's not the two inter aren't interacting. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not that you not, you can't cut taxes, but I think you have to provide uh, information about where the source, the extra revenue came from to mm -hmm. offset the, the cut in the tax. Yeah. So you can do it. You just have to justify it essentially. Right. Um, the comment, Mr. Chairman, is I, we definitely need to start as a board coming up with uh, with priorities for this. I think what the board has stated um, has come to consensus on I think is that it's interested in a diversion center which may be um, the highest ticket item maybe and maybe the highest priority item that we've talked about um, I, I think we need to create similar to, to what we did when we when we looked at the LMA EMCO provider which became VIA create a subgroup, get a couple commissioners on it, get some folks from staff on it, start talking to, to VIA, Cone, RHA about, um, about a uh, 
facility, a location, and about operations and get to some kind of consensus on that quickly so that we can determine if that's the most important thing that this board determines that we need to move with, and it is, if not the most pricey item, at least up there, um, that might start to affect decisions of what we can afford for other things. So I think we need to quickly understand what that, the direction we need to go on that in terms of those two issues. And we've got some options on the board, that are on the table there, that we yes we need to respond to rather quickly if we if we decide we want to take it, avail ourselves of them. Yes. Mr. Turner, I think you're very much on point. Uh, Ms. Thompson and I are the two volume reps at this point. So, and we can, do not want more than two county commissioners on that subcommittee. Uh, let me recommend that we set up a meeting uh, with two county commissioners, Ms. Thompson and myself, uh, Mr. Haygood, uh, Andrea, Brian. yeah, uh, Sherry Hook. What other members, Brian, would need to be on this? Um, we don't want it to be very large, sure. but we want to be, don't leave anybody. I'm trying to think, uh, maybe uh, someone the from the department sheriff's department office uh, would be reasonable. I'm looking at Sherry, maybe someone from the sheriff's office and maybe uh, Chief could, could talk with his folks back at the uh, sheriff's office about who would be appropriate to serve on a, what I'm hearing is like a diversion center subcommittee mm -hmm. discussion group to, so uh, Chief, would you be able to, just let us know a route perhaps from the sheriff's office. They've been on the ground floor of that effort since uh, the beginning, so it'd be appropriate, I think. Would it also be appropriate to put um, our health director on that? Certainly, yes, yeah, absolutely. If he's interested in serving, I know uh, Ashley yes, is yes, uh, yes. is uh, working there at, uh, at health too, so I think uh, that would be appropriate. And director of DSS, as Mr. Carter's indicating. Sure. I, I need to make a comment, and I'll be brief. It's about the diversion center. Um, I support a diversion center 100% because I know it walks across the street into the jail. But a diversion center is very temporary as far as we've got certain amount of times that we're saying it's better than what we've got right now. 16 beds, seven to 10 days, and all that. That is still not aftercare. That is just temporary. Um, I've had two of the worst situations with two of our clients for out of town treatment centers. Oh my goodness. And that can't happen in Alamance County, what my clients have went through. The thing about it is, is this all sounds great and it can be great. But if you divert these people to the diversion center and they're there for a temporary stay, and if you don't have anywhere to send them, which is a big issue, you are just fooling yourself into thinking this is a great idea. You better get you one of those real pretty circular doors like they have over at ARMC because it's going to be that way with clients. This, and I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is a population that you don't fix and you certainly don't fix them in seven to ten days. This is just, it's just the most broken people in the world and I, I will not support a diversion center that does not have aftercare that you can absolutely guarantee because Alamance County doesn't have the aftercare the size of what we need. I'm having a search all over the state. If you got private insurance, you're good. But if you don't, good luck. And I mean, and a lot of folks in this situation don't have private right. insurance. This is, this is tough. It's frustrating. It's like, why do you do this? <clears throat> then you know why you do this. But, and I mean it. I am the biggest wannabe sheriff deputy on this commission board, and I will support law enforcement till my last breath because I work in direct services with this population. It is absolutely hard, hard work. But if we don't have somewhere to send these diversion folks, that I know are going to be cared for with whatever. And if you think outpatient treatment works for everybody, they got to get there. <laughs> they, they just can't get in their flying saucer and go there. This is so big. I, I don't even know. It's just so big. And I only know a small part of it because of what I work with. And I, guys, I, I want this too. I know the money we're talking. This ain't about a building. It's about what's walking in that building. 
And you got young people to too. I had JC, PC, me and Dave. Susan's been with me at every meeting today. We are twins. Now we're twins. And I'm hearing about all these programs, diversion programs they've got, because we've raised the age up to almost 18. And this has really changed a lot of stuff. And, and they've got all these other programs, and right now they're having trouble filling the spots in their agencies to take care of all these folks. And then you got parents gone, I don't want to mess with that. You know, I'm just, my kid ain't that problem. I mean, it's unbelievable what I heard today. And I told Chad Laws, I said, I want JCPC to present to this Board of Commissioners because we're always hearing about shortages of detention workers, the crisis they're facing, DSS, the crisis they're facing. We've had ambulances sitting because we didn't have enough. And I'm just going to say this, you can't pay this out and fix it because if you could, all your millions for the school system, you wouldn't have any problems. Money does not fix this. Commitment and aftercare and loyalty and strong people that work in this business that really know what they're doing. And, um, and then, then the other meeting I was in there, I watched Senior Services Day. All their extra funding that they're needing because of the need, 155 additional people on Meals on Wheels. And I'm thinking, how were they eating before if all of a sudden they can be on Meals on Wheels because of this COVID money? What are we going to do with these people after this money runs out? Because they're still going to be hungry. And I think we have got to get our heads around this. This is a temporary genie in a bottle. And sooner or later, we're going to rub it, and he ain't coming out. And that's my biggest fear with diversion, because we cannot convince ourselves if we have something temporary, it's going to really make a difference for these folks. It's going to make a difference for us. It's kind of like the warning sign on a pack of cigarettes. Don't do this. It's dangerous for your health. That's about the manufacturer feeling good about themselves. But for God's sakes, buy these cigarettes, because we need to make money off of it. I, it just infuriates me, and I know I don't need to be doing this, but you know what? I'm going to because I'm committed to helping this population, but I'm not committed to building something that is not going to really help this population instead of just keeping them out of the jail because there's more to keeping them out of the jail. I got told today that somebody was refused from RHA of what kind of Medicaid they have. What the heck is that about? I didn't know there were kinds of Medicaid. I learn something new every day. We are not perfect. On our best day, sometimes we're not even good. At least I can describe myself that way. But we, we got to really think big picture in this because I want a big building and I want it to be beautiful. But I want what happens in that building to outshine any kind of brick that's sitting on a piece of land. And, um, and I mean it, I will not support this if we don't think big picture on this because we are not dealing with temporary issues. These are long-term traumatic issues. People have been damaged beyond what any of us can understand. And if you think seven to 10 days, you're gonna get Barbara Eaton and do this thing with, you know, I dream a genie, it's not gonna happen. Let and me slow you down. I, I don't need to slow down. I'm what are you telling you. About? I'm what, telling you, we've got, talking I'm about talking building? about your diversion center. You're gonna have to have more than just a diversion center. You don't have a lot of places. To Tell us what people. it is. It's, an, it's a place that they can stay instead of sending them all over the county, out of county, to try and find treatment. We need our own treatment center here. That's what we need because not everyone has a place to go. And it's just really sad because, you, trust me, we make phone calls all the time, don't have anybody. When you're expecting and you're using meth, and you try to get somebody horizons, it's two months. Do you know what will happen to a fetus in two months if that mother keeps using meth? I mean, this is real. This is ugly. It's so hideous. But we can't just think a diversion center is going to really help with these long-lasting problems with these people. And they may never change. But we've got to have somewhere to send them. And it's really limited, John. I know you know this. And, um, I don't know, I just don't want us to get so caught up in having a diversion center and saying we have one and think that's going to really fix our problems. And I think that's the good thing about Cone Health being involved. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, Medical. It is, you know, Mark Gordon came to the public hearing we had, said invite me to, invite Cone to help you. And I think we did. And I mean, Cone is probably the best entity to talk about a continuum of care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think them being at the table really can inform where we, where we can go with it. Well, the people, Guilford called me about what they have in Guilford and um, and there's aftercare there. We just we just can't get caught on one idea when we don't think about the whole picture. Because right. this is a population that's increasing, it's growing. 
Uh, COVID has certainly not helped it. If anything, it's just blew it out of the map. And you're seeing our younger people get more and more addicted as well. And um, it's just something to really think about. One of the things I'm look, listening to here is it sounds like with what we're putting on the table with the separate committee and with other things, and with a short turnaround, we need to have to try and move this forward. Instead of having two regular meetings in February, we might need to look at including another work session in February to try and sit down and, try and, and work through some of these issues and some of these opportunities. Does that sound reasonable to y'all? I'd rather be able to plan for it and put it on our, get it on our calendar than, than have it come up at the last minute and be trying to scramble around with a, I don't know what your calendars look like, but mine's getting harder and harder to throw something in that wasn't already on there. Well, I think if we have a work session, we need to have folks that are in this business exactly. with aftercare that can really enlighten us to understand what we're actually dealing with. I think it might make sense to wait till the next meeting to determine that and see how far with a subcommittee can get and see if it's even worth if they're getting down the road far enough for mm -hmm. to have everybody. I'm okay with that. I just I don't want us to get to, to February the whatever the next meeting is and say well we need to have one next week and everybody's trying to scramble to figure out how to make it happen next week. So see, I'm I'm speaking to you as an advocate, not I as know. a commissioner, and it, it's really it's the most hideous environment to see what people are doing to themselves because well, I think of everybody addiction. sitting at this table wants yeah. to find a permanent solution not a temporary solution this is so hard I work I don't think there's a I don't think there's a question at all about your passion and your concern for these issues these these individuals we we all want to find solutions to get them to be. I want Alamance okay. County to be the ultimate example of how to deal with this not just to show up Showing up is big, but we got to be an example for our state. I think the idea of bringing Cone Health into it is a great idea. And, and we've got capacity in space. Cone Health has already looked at some of the issue, or some of the availability of space over in East Burlington at the uh, uh, Old Western Electric facility. So there's, there's capacity in there that's not contaminated, I believe. So, um, Okay, let's move on to um, item 8-1. Mr. Chairman, uh, we have Candace from the Department of Social Services that I believe is on Zoom that's going to present that item uh, to the commissioners. Wow, she's been here for a long time. Yes, County Manager. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Department of Social Services to request a, a approval for a budget amendment. Um, the Department of Social Services has received notification from NCDHHS regarding a pandemic leap a lot, at, or I'm sorry, allocation. Um, LEAP stands for the Low Income Energy Assistance Program. This program provides a one-time vendor payment to assist eligible households with their heating bills. This funding will be used to provide an automated payment to households with children aged 0 to 10 and who are currently <coughs> receiving nutrition services and also received LEAP assistance last fiscal year. Um, the allocation amount for Alamance County is $1,112,382. There is no county match required for this funding and we are just asking for the approval of these funds so that the lines can be established. Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Just take it. Uh, we don't have any other speakers, I understand. That's correct, Mr. All right. So we'll skip down to uh, county attorney. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to give you an update on the national opioid settlement. The deadline nationally to accept the settlement from the four largest entities was January 2nd. Um, Alamance, of course, had signed on many months ago, but in order to get the most money out of the defendant, it necessitated a, virtually 100% of counties and cities with populations over 30,000 signing on. Um, 
in the weeks leading up to Christmas, we were getting there, but short, and all of us on that committee worked very, very hard over the holidays to make sure that everybody signed on, and North Carolina, I'm very proud to say, is the first state, and I haven't heard of a second one that's made it, that met that 100% mark. Um, there were a number of other states that were close, and the court did extend the deadline with the consent of the defendants um, it, it, through the end of this week. Um, there will be funds coming in over 18 years. We expect the first you can expect in Alamance County the first check. Uh, we don't know the exact amount yet, and I know that's a question, but we've asked it and, and National can't tell us yet, but that should come somewhere between as early as May and as late as August, um, but that has not finally been determined. The last question I've been asked about uh, is about Purdue Pharma, Purdue Pharma bankruptcy. And that had been finally mediated, negotiated, but as all bankruptcy uh, agreements have to do, they have to be approved by the bankruptcy court. In this case, the Sackler family was contributing personal millions of dollars into that settlement. Their attorneys were requiring releases from any future litigation from states to do that. And the bankruptcy court for that reason rejected that uh, bankruptcy settlement because the court did not have the authority to require or enforce these settlements outside of it. So, so that unfortunately has been put aside, that initial order, and everybody at the national level is back at the table trying to see if they can figure out an alternative solution. And that's what I wanted you to know about opioids tonight. Any other, anything else? I have nothing further. Thank you. Okay, County Manager. So just a few items, uh, Commissioners. One, we are going to update the uh, $48 million ARP eligible project list and get that to you ASAP. So you can be looking uh, uh, for that to be coming to you probably through email. So we'll go back to everything we heard uh, at the public hearing as well as uh, things that we were questionable for, uh, for that list. We'll, we'll get all that too. So you can be thinking about those projects in total. Um, also, I wanted to speak to, uh, we are developing, uh, HR is working with detention, DSS, and EMS to uh, create a new hire report that we will be sharing with the commissioners every month. We can start that next month. Sherry and Cheryl have been working with the, uh, the HR functions in DSS and uh, also at detention to put that together so we'll all be on the same page. I, in fact, I had asked uh, maybe um, the Chief Deputy, and we also have Adrian Day and Ray Vipperman who stuck with us through this <laughs> meeting also, because uh, while it's probably a little early for me to try to give you a hard numbers for how that has affected our hiring, what we will do is we will use December 8th of 2021 as the base, the number of vacancies that those departments had then, so we can try to help you see what, what uh, the impact was for the for the uh, uh, salary changes that you made but I thought it just if quickly chief I don't know if you and then maybe Adrian and also Ray can speak to just what you're seeing so far we don't have a report for you tonight but uh, I don't know if there's anything you can say chief about the impacts that y'all are seeing at this point yes sir and thank you again for uh for providing those funds to our detention center. We've seen approximately 60% increase in interest in application. And without naming specifics, we have um, inquiries from some of our surrounding detention center for lateral. We've had interest from former employees who had gone to other places, wanted to return. And we have several uh, applicants in our queue. And um, all that data will be provided to the county, and uh, but we're seeing a difference. Awesome. It takes a little long. You can't just go and fill those positions. So we still have 32 positions non-frozen in detention, but we are hiring people in the process, and we have numerous applicants. And and again, um, I'll just give you one example. We had a we have a 13-year veteran with a degree 
um, who is wanting to come with us from another place that uh, we are competitive in being able to fulfill incentives based on uh, previous experience, education, military, all those things, and we can uh, we can bring someone with 13 years of experience in an outstanding employee because we're attractive uh, and competitive. So thank Wonderful. You. That's awesome. awesome. Good news, Adrian. Uh, would you would you mind at this point maybe thank you for staying with us and uh, would you be able to speak a little bit to what y'all are seeing at this point early? I know it's early, but what you're seeing at DSS from the impacts from these salary changes. Absolutely. Um, I would echo what um, Cliff said. We are very appreciative for the increase and also for the recognition of the staffing issues that we were experiencing at DSS. Um, just since this has been implemented, we have had five new hires. Um, we've also hired two of our former employees back with us. And we um, got word last week that we have two other former employees who are interested in coming back with us. So we, we are definitely starting to see that it's making a difference. While our vacancy rates are still about the same, we are starting to see um, interest in our positions, which is, which is very encouraging. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. And Ray, thank you also for sticking, sticking with us to the, to the <laughs> end here. But uh, from EMS's perspective, can you comment on any of, the, any of the, these kind of early impacts y'all are seeing from the, the changes that were made? Uh, sure. So I'll echo Adrian and Cliff. Uh, very thankful that the, the board took that action. Um, we noticed an immediate impact to morale, as, as Tony alluded to earlier in the meeting. These are some of the more stressful days of the pandemic, and our folks are in it uh, 24 7, 365, doing a great job. And so I, I think they've really enjoyed uh, seeing the support that you all have given. Uh, we have had three part-time employees choose to come with us full-time, which is nice uh, to fill three vacancies. Uh, we've got another individual that we're hiring full-time uh, that is currently not with the agency, but will be soon. And then we're working with HR to kind of retool our uh, advertising for positions uh, in, in anticipation of some of the spring graduations of the paramedic program. So we want to try to be as uh, competitive as we can be to to get some new folks in and, and more importantly keep the folks we have happy. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Adrian. Chief, appreciate it very much. So, commissioners, you can be looking for a, uh, a uniform report from uh, from the county to you starting next month that will try to keep you posted on how this is panning out, how vacancies are being filled, uh, and all those kind of things. So, wanted to be sure you all stayed up to date with that and know that we are preparing that report. The uh, other item I want to touch on is in your packet. Have included a copy of a, a budget calendar for fiscal year 22-23. Um, this is uh, to give you an idea of it's very similar to last year these dates one thing I think that was really uh, helpful this year that uh, uh, Josh added was this column about state statute requirement if you're interested in that which kind of lets you know we're staying on target there are some statutory requirements that we have to meet from a date perspective and we're this calendar does meet those I think um, you can see that the county department uh, budget requests are going to be going out uh, soon and they are due back to um, budget department February 28th and then uh, our outside agency budget requests are also going out and they will also be back due back to county government February 28th that does include the school system and the community college although uh, we usually get those back particularly the school system that's such a huge budget for them to put together it may not necessarily come in on the 28th the law requires that it's presented to the county by May 15th they get it in before then but uh, uh, we do we do consider them in with outside agencies but I suspect that that will come in sometime after February 28th the month of March is really spent management budget folks meeting with county departments talking about what have you sent in what's your priority trying to notate those things um, and then we are looking in March, March 21st, commissioner meeting presenting a draft of the capital plan. So that, that capital plan is pretty well set. It's in pretty good shape considering the, uh, the funding that's been put to it, the project uh, listing that's been done. March 21st, we'll plan to do uh, a presentation to the commissioners. I do think in the next 
several weeks, the commissioners need to be thinking about the month of April. Last year, the commissioners did, I believe, a two-day budget retreat where everyone that was requesting funding, county departments, outside agencies came and presented. It took two days. So uh, it's probably a good idea to be thinking in your minds about what are dates that, if you want to do that again, consider two dates in the month of April that uh, you can schedule time that we will start working to get that word out. But um, uh, that, that will be uh, important for the commissioners to, uh, and the new county manager to also stop, observe stop. Uh, and see that. So I thought that's maybe why you stopped at March. <laughs> no more, no more. Uh, no, page, page two, page two goes on. But uh, yes, so the, uh, the, uh, then with this calendar does show the, the presentation of the manager's recommended budget being May 16th. And then uh, commissioners uh, holding a public hearing on June 6th and hopefully adopting the budget on June the 20th. But I uh, wanted to put this in your hands so you could be thinking about it. I do think out of all this at this point, you, sh you should be thinking uh, and talking about with us and yourselves the, the um, budget retreat dates. So um, I believe that is all the, the information I was going to pass. So. Brian, I know the school, um, they got all this ESSER money, which is COVID money, all this stuff. And I know that um, they recently gave their teachers the raise. It was about like ten million dollars. That also bumped some schools from getting their air quality systems done. Is what's going to happen with that? Because the whole system could use that when it comes to that. That's a biggie for COVID uh, relief funds. Has, do you know if there's another source for them to? take care of the schools that they kind of knocked off that list? Have there been any conversations with Jeremy about that? So I think we we have a, a TRC meeting coming up. Is it this week, I believe? 25th next Tuesday. Yes. So uh, we'll be talking with them about, and I think what we're starting to talk with the college and the school system about is some of their unfunded projects. You know, they provided the commissioners with a, uh, a top 10 list, right, at the time that they knew of that was uh, unfunded, right? So, and that would not include anything that was on the ESSER list that they might have had to adjust. Right. So we'll be talking with them about, okay, these projects that you lost uh, from your ESSER funding, where do they fall in your spectrum, right? Are they more important than the things you've told us are your, your very top priorities, uh, or they fall somewhere else in the list? Are you planning on addressing them with your $3.3 million a year, or are you gonna be talking to us about uh, additional debt requests or using capital reserves in a one-time because they have capacity to do those things they, they currently in their own plan have capacity for additional debt or a one-time infusion of capital reserves that one-time thing would affect their future debt capacity but uh, I think we're going to want to hear from them on the 25th where do those projects fall how important are they to you where do they where do they fit so Are oh, there any other county commissioner comments? I have my regular question. <laughs> <laughs> and You're up. Go. And, and the same response. <laughs> Thank you. Just check. <laughs> I, think we, we, I, I did reach out to our auditors and said, now that we have final rule, have you seen a compliance supplement come out yet from the federal government? And they said no, that they are anticipating to receive that any day. And as soon as they have it, they will let me know. Excellent. So. And commissioners, I, I would I would say as you as you consider these art funds, as you consider <clears throat> what you might do with your three point eight million dollar uh, supplant money, know that we are going to add to unassigned fund balance. We are going to add from fiscal year uh, twenty twenty one. Mm -hmm. Right. So those we will add to it, and a lot of it will be because sales tax revenue came in so far above projection. That is the lion's share of it. That is going to be funding that is again you can. You need to be thinking about what you want to do with that. If anything, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a healthy fund balance, but if you have projects or you have implications for budgeting that you may want to use that for, then that's something to bear in mind. The audit will tell us the true number, but we, we you know, we do have some thoughts about what that might be. So just bear that, bear that in mind that those funds uh, could be at play as you talk about these projects. Too. Or a tax decrease. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Your lead right. pipe comment. Because lead pipes didn't exist till COVID, right? <laughs> like lead paint and asbestos. Only since COVID do we have these issues. Just wondering. Well, Commissioner Thompson and I had an opportunity the other day. In addition to the life-saving event that was supposed to be held tonight, Commissioner Thompson and I had an opportunity the other day to meet a deputy who is 
spent the majority of their life in service to Alamance County. And uh, we just felt like the rest of you ought to get, it, get that chance as well. I've mentioned it to uh, John, and he agrees. And so we're going to hopefully have canine officer, Grim, who retired from last week, uh, visit with us. It will be an in, it will be an entertaining. Is he gonna bring his dog? That he is, is the dog. dog. No, that is the dog. He is the dog. And just remember, if you are late, bring his human. he will be in your chair. Right. You can ask him to get out of it. <laughs> and good luck with that. He's so pretty. Yeah, Mr. Hagen, you can add that to the thing if you want. He is so. The sheriff got him a new toy. Oh my gosh! Oh, my be all over that thing he, the, and his owner, his trainer, would get near me. I'm out the. Oh my gosh! He's just. Oh, it's just something else. He should be on The Bachelor. I'm telling you, this dog is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> he was just unbelievable. God. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Uh, so I move. So, second. second. Whatever. I was going to ask. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Hey, hey, Thomas. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.